Johnston, who is going to be joining us today. Uh, we believe we've reached out. He should be he should be joining us. Uh, but uh, Kale's here. What's up, hot dogs? Tyler will be with us as well. And uh, Marco is uh, AIing somewhere. No, no, no. He's on vacation. He's um, unplugged for once. He's unplugged. <laughs> That's good. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here and hanging out with us. We've got uh, we've got a lot to talk about as far as Absolute DC is concerned. Um, so we're going to dive into all that here. Now, as we wait for Rich, I figure I can lay down sort of the groundwork for what all of this is or or what what has come before that has led to this point. So around New York Comic Con time, uh, a rumor started to float around about the prospect of an Ultimate DC. Now, I think the rumor actually came out of New York Comic Con. Like, I think it spun out of that event and out of the bar scene and the conversations that were taking place because that's when Rich started reporting it. Hmm. Now, I heard about this rumor separately at the con uh so did marco and tyler but we can't say from who but i can definitely say interesting that, yeah <laughs> i can definitely say that the person who said this seems like somebody who would know about this kind of thing go ahead no i can't say it no i'm not gonna say that because it yeah i wasn't there so i'm gonna make this joke out of complete ignorance and then you could completely ignore it, but because we've brought attention to it now, it was Scott Snyder. That's it funny. wasn't Scott Snyder. It was I don't know it, that it, for a it, fact. It definitely <laughs> wasn't. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it definitely wasn't Scott Snyder. Um, but it was someone that I I believe would know. So when I heard it from them, I was like, Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So that's that's happening. And then of course we saw the articles come out from Rich Johnson about the possibility of a DC sort of offshoot that is ultimate style. Like when you think about the ultimates and you think about how, you know, it's the same characters, but it's reimagined and it's no continuity um, or at least not pre-existing continuity, that kind of thing. It's like an in and out order. Yeah. It's like a uh, cheeseburger and a side of fries. And a, oh, 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 can I get those? Uh, Ultimate style. <laughs> hey, yeah, that could be a thing. I could see that. Ultimate yeah. style fries. You have oh, you probably couldn't. You had you ever been to an In and Out? I have. Yeah. Okay. You probably couldn't get the the animal style though. Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. Over. I'll tell you. I'll tell you this, Kale. Even if I could get it, I wouldn't get it. It's just too much. You know what? I believe you. <laughs> yeah, it's too much. Uh, all right, so that's the idea. That's the premise that we're working with is that DC is looking to launch a new universe, uh, an ultimate style universe, and that Scott Snyder is the person who is going to spearhead it, who's going to run that whole thing uh, as kind of like a, kind of like a showrunner. You know, he's doing that now on Witches, which is uh, which is an animated series based on one of his books. Yep. And he's show running that and he's writing that. So Scott Snyder fits that role very well. He's a teacher. He knows how to work with other creators. So that's that makes total sense to me. Hmm. You know, you know, what's interesting about that, too, is that's sort of the style they were going for for uh, X-Men. Uh, for the Krakoan era, that's sort of what Hickman's role was. So I wonder if DC sort of took a little bit of notice with that, and they were like, "Okay, this that seems to be interesting." And I'm, you know, I several of the writers of the X Men crew have sort of transitioned over. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if um, some experience or whatever has been uh, uh, spoken about and, you know. Sure, that actually makes sense to me. And I think it makes even more sense 
when you think about the fact that DC's, I mean, they weren't they weren't ultimate, but their relaunches over the last twenty years uh, have been very very like editorial or top down driven, mm-hmm. because New Fifty Two, of course, was totally editorial, and then Rebirth was you know Jeff Johns, but it was very he. I mean, he himself was. I don't remember if he was literally I think he was on the other side of things at that point. I think that was when he became CCO or or C he, he had some title I I want to say something. Yeah. 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 So they were receiving their their bullet points and their 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 you know their uh, their marching orders from Jeff Johns. And of course Dan Didio still had a heavy hand in things. This new status quo that we're going to it's not even a status quo. This new relaunch mm. is supposedly going to be. Yeah, Spiral, this is the absolute thing. This is supposedly going to be um, really hands off and not editorial driven. So when we use the word showrunner for Scott Snyder, it's really like gathering the, the team, you know, the creatives yeah. that are going to be in the picture. And then my understanding, based on what Rich has reported, is that we're going to see um, kind of kind of a like a free flow development of these characters and the initial stories that we're going to see, with really the creators involved being the ones to hash all that out. Mm. Yeah, chief creative officer, I believe was the title that he had at that time. And just in case you're you're still jumping in. Uh, we are waiting on Rich Johnson. We're expecting to have him on today um, to discuss Absolute DC. So hopefully uh, we hear from him here in a few moments. Uh, Anthony Koser, hopefully I said that right, says, Hey, pals, as usual, great shows and discussions all around top notch. Thank you, Anthony. Appreciate you. Definitely seen you around before. Um, thank you for the support. Uh, JRPG Time says... Is this James Gunn Superman? No, that is a different thing. That's the movie stuff. Mm. Um, I think that we will see the fruits of collaboration between Jim Lee and James Gunn, but I don't know that it's going to result in any changes on the comic book side of things. I think that might be more like maybe promotion, you know, promoting the specific books that um, that James Gunn is being... Um, inspired by and maybe jim lee can say hey did you look at this title that we did did you look at that title that we did these might be good jumping on points or good for you to look at for future film ideas but i don't think that their relationship is necessarily going to be affecting the co- the comics directly uh what else what else do we have uh, Chad Crowder, is this more Marvel Knights style than Ultimate Line? So what we're specifically talking about right now, the absolute DC aspect of this, is more like Ultimates than Marvel Knights. Yeah, Marvel Knights is a little more, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think I am. It was a little more adult oriented. I know they had like, at the time there was also it was Marvel Max that could have been like the previous one or something but um marvel knights add a little bit more mature storytelling and stuff that was always my understanding of marvel knights yeah um so i i would imagine this would be more like the ultimate line in that it's a more uh modern condensed way to uh tell more streamlined stories give a more streamlined history of these characters yeah whoever these characters may be mike Choi says came in from tiktok welcome mike Choi. thanks for hanging out yeah hey we had we had uh we had tiktok going for a minute there um and i think we might even be live on tiktok right now well so if we are hello tiktok um i'm terrified of you (laughs) <laughs> tiktok's decent what's wrong with tiktok i'm too old my back hurts too much to be on tiktok 
You're always a backflip. Uh, <laughs> a backflip and trying to get out of TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, Comic Boom says, but some editorial insight is important. Oversight is important. It is about a healthy balance. Um, Yes. And I don't think that this means that there won't be editorial oversight. I just think it means that the decisions about what can and cannot happen won't come from editorial. So editorial mm -hmm. is infinitely important when you're talking about the shared universe aspect of things because you have to keep things on track. My mind in this, in this situation says, well, this is so new and fresh that creators can get in a room just like you would do on a show right a television show that doesn't have editors the way we think about comic book editors and they can just create and they can just vibe and they can just make it happen and an editor can say okay that doesn't make sense or you know that doesn't line up with this other thing that you guys discussed but not say this is the story because that's what Dan Didio was doing Dan yeah. Didio said this is what the story is you guys go tell it i would imagine will an editor's role in this situation would probably be something if uh, along the lines of, you know, Superman can't rip a guy's head off and then eat it. You know, you can't have that imagery, especially not with the the logo on the can't sell that toy. So you probably can't, uh, you know, do that. But in terms of the stuff, you know, around that and leading up to that, they would be able to find a way around that if that's something that needed to happen yeah yeah i i i but i do agree some editorial in, uh, oversight is good and i think they will have that um rami says hope it is going to be marketed well to bring new readers so there is a whole other aspect of this thing that uh rich reported on that actually i feel like no one has talked about um that i think is really interesting uh, I really don't want to get into that quite yet. I want to give Rich a little bit more time to show up. Um, we've reached out, so hopefully he sees the messages and can can hang out. Um, even if he can't, if he if he's unable to make it, we, you know, I'm sure we can make it right with him and and get him on at some point. Um, but yeah, I still anticipate that he will he will be here. Um, Atomic Counts says, wasn't Marvel Knights labeled as what came from Joe Q Studio before he came aboard as EIC? Agree the content had an edge. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know the intimate details of the history of Marvel Knights. It's kind of a, for me at least, I don't know about you, Kale, but for me, that's kind of like a, it's, it's a black spot or a blank spot for me. Mm -hmm. I haven't dived deep into much of Marvel Knights at all. A lot of Daredevil stuff, like the uh, the Kevin Smith Daredevil stuff, would have yeah. been Marvel Knights. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess I don't know for sure. But that does make sense to me because uh, I he wouldn't Casada wouldn't have been EIC. Yet. Yeah. So that does yeah. yeah that does make sense to me. How do you um? How, how do you feel about the idea of, I don't know, just the name Absolute DC, if that's so what I, they were to go with? Yeah, right, right. Um, I like it. I think it has some pedigree in terms mm. of, you know, they use that name for some amount of their, their Omnibuy or whatever, the special editions. Oh, that that's they right. Yeah, 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 of course. Um, and then didn't even make that connection. Yeah, well, and then with absolute power coming up as well, absolute is is just one of those things that DC likes to go to at this point, I guess. So to me, I like that synergy. I think yeah. it sounds bold. It sounds powerful. Um, the only thing, the only kind of question mark I have about it is just the fact that when I think of absolute in DC, I think about definitive. Yeah. This is the absolute de de definitive version of the Dark Knight Returns, for example. Right. Because this is an offshoot and not definitive, it kind of messes with my brain. But I think that that's something that can quickly be overcome. Uh, that connects to MP's question. Should the Absolute Universe retell some of the same stories but more modernized? 
should there be an absolute version of Death and Return of Superman or Nightfall? Uh, it's that first part that I want to focus on for a second is the absolute universe retelling some of the same stories but modernized. I think that could go to what you're talking about if you know if they if that absolute moniker is uh for making a definitive statement on you know this book being canon or uh you know whatever mm -hmm. this could be uh that could you know there's a, a potential for that to be the purpose of this movement right to take a modernized definitive stance you know for 2020 or you know the next 60 years or whatever yeah so i think that's pretty interesting i think that's an interesting concept i don't i don't see the creators wanting to come on board to just modernize stories that came before um, I see them wanting to take these characters in new and bold and radical directions. And the reporting that Rich has done so far seems to lend to that idea. Um, I, I, I feel like we're going to see, I, I don't feel like we're going to see them uh, just retell stories. Maybe that could be a part of it, but. Well, um, and, and it's yeah, a bit yeah. like um, it's it's a bit. I would say that's a bit like um, Bendis and Ultimate Spider-Man. You know, uh, he didn't. He had Gwen Stacy and he had a bridge and the Green Goblin, but it wasn't mm -hmm. Gwen Stacy he had thrown off the bridge, right? Um, but those are like weirdly connected moments. You know, where if you're a Spider-Man fan, you know what that's gonna b exactly it, it it sort of plays off the history yeah in an interesting way but it is a remix and i suspect that that's what this will be very yeah. a very remixed type of thing um i don't see it though and this is just pure speculation on my part i don't see it being you know like the ultimate universe right now has a through line that spins out of mainline universe yeah. with the maker and everything like that. Yeah. I don't see that happening at this point. I actually don't feel right now that absolute DC spins out of the events of act of absolute power. Hmm. I, I don't actually think that now. I, yeah, get, just given what I have seen so far, it doesn't, quite feel like this is a big enough thing to make that happen you know what i mean it doesn't feel like a crisis level event where something like that would come through you know like not even brainiac being involved in however uh in whatever way he is that, that still doesn't quite feel like enough to spark a whole new universe Right, exactly. Like, what would be the reason for an entirely new universe with fresh versions of these characters to spin out yeah. of this? Um, that that doesn't I, I don't I don't know how you get to that place. The only thing I can think of if we're just spitballing is the fact that um Amanda Waller is trying to remove the power from metahumans on Earth. Mm. Mm -hmm. so how does she do that where does that power go you know is she just oh, storing it is yeah. it being sent somewhere what happens to the place it's being sent is it is it something like that that maybe that combined power is enough to create a whole other universe somewhere in the multiverse that but again that's pure speculation on my part mm. uh atomic hound says i think the most interesting question is are they starting from day one and not make the new 52 mistake of having some characters continuity largely intact based on sales so again everything we're saying here is based on really rich's reporting and nothing else so based on what we have seen the answer to that is 
there is no reboot happening. So mainline continuity will still be what it is. And then this will exist as a separate thing that features fresh, new versions of these characters. So I would be surprised if there's any holdover as far as like specific story beats. Like, you know how in the new 52, they literally followed off from where Grant and co left off with batman this won't be that this won't be that yeah there's no way there's no way there could be yeah yeah this this won't be that so i don't think i don't i think this will be a clean break from main continuity in that regard Mm -hmm. in that regard and likely to bring in new readers yeah exactly um so again, we're still waiting on Rich. At this point, I'm a little bit, I'm not fully sure what's going on, but uh, I do want to, if he comes, we'll be glad to have him. I want to move this conversation a little bit forward because there is a whole other aspect of this that I find fascinating. And so I'm going to refer to Rich's article here um, because he says something really interesting. So here, here, here we go. Um, but there will not be a reboot or even a relaunch of the main line that will remain intact continuity and, and continuity will continue on because the other name I have heard of which absolute comics is a part is DC all in the broader initiative Snyder and other creators have been working on make of that what you will. This is most definitely being seen as an attempt to do new 52, right? alongside a DC Rebirth which a mu- with a much more holistic approach that the team on DC All In are aiming to give fans something bold while leaving alone what's already working. So, essentially, and he elaborates on this, uh he he elaborates on this. So I'm gonna actually I'm actually going to read his elaboration before we go forward because this is critical. As part of that, Absolute Comics will be a line radically reworked versions of well-known DC Comics characters from major comics creators in the fashion of Marvel's Ultimate line, separate in continuity from the rest of DC, but sharing its own internal continuity between the books, unlike Elseworlds, All-Star, or Black Label. However, unlike the Ultimate line, there is intended from the get-go to be some bleed-through so that the Absolute Comics line will be in the same multiverse as standard DC continuity, suggesting awareness of each other, maybe competition, or even crossover between them in years to come. That's par for the course, I think. Well, let's look at the standard example, that being Ultimate Universe. The original one. Yeah. It took, from my knowledge, a pretty long time for those universes to uh, develop any kind of awareness of each other. Sure. And it wasn't necessarily built to be that way up front. Right. Right. And the more sales waned for the ultimate side of things, the more crossover there started to be. We got Spider-Man. We got Supreme Power. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but there was something something like that. Um, so for this to be the the plan up front, I think that's pretty interesting. I think it I think it it sort of bakes in the um the flash two of two worlds scenario. Yeah. You know, where they can eventually they can have their two flashes running at the the same guy in two different universes cover again. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just, I think for me, that part is a little bit, look, DC is the land of the multiverse, mm-hmm. right? Regardless of how much it's been and it's been popularized in public by Marvel, that's what DC is known for. So the idea that they would do an ultimate style relaunch and not include it somewhere in the multiverse wouldn't be DC. That's what DC does. For me, if this is meant to attract new readers, or, or lapsed readers, people who aren't connected to DC Comics right now, I think that keeping it segregated from mainline makes a lot of sense. 
We see Superman interact with other versions of Superman all the time, but because this is going to be a standing universe, it should stand on its own. Yeah, I agree. And frankly, I think if this is what they're if this is an approach they're going to do, they need to sort of close off the idea of traveling to other universes for a while. Yeah. That way these two can be separate and do their own thing and build out their own stories. But then when they decide to make it happen, it has big, big impact. Sure. Exactly. Like a major crossover. Yeah. I mean, Marvel was able to get a lot out of Secret Wars. Um, yeah. A lot. And that wasn't just uh, Ultimate versus Mainline, but that played into the lead-in to that event. Right. Um, so I feel like there is mileage there for sure. And even, even in old DC, when the two universes found each other earth one and earth two it took a while before they were like interacting on the reg and then finally crisis happened you know right. um so i i think that's the move how long do you think they'll actually go with it go with it like wait until they do a big event and <laughs> Well, if the plan is for them to be connected immediately, editorial would love to do it within a year. Like the the upper echelon would love to do it within a year. Yeah. I feel like the creatives involved would want way more time than that. Yeah. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say at least two years. I, that that would be my bet. And I think I think you're looking at it a lot more optimistically than I am, because to me, two years is too short mm. yeah it, sound, it sounds like you're saying uh the executives would want one and the creatives are like no no, no we have to plan for this so it's got to be at least two i would think that the creatives would probably not want that to happen for a longer time yeah because scott snyder has been playing in the dc sandbox for literally since his career in comics started pretty much and he's never had an opportunity to do things from the ground up. Mm. At the, I mean, who has, right? Like n most people haven't. Um, so for him, this would be exciting. I would imagine Jason Aaron, Al Ewing, whoever it is that they get, I would imagine yeah. that they'd be very excited by that prospect and wouldn't want to move past it too quickly. Right. And P says, I bet we get absolute crisis. Oh, fuck. Dude, that's absolute, it. <laughs> absolute crisis in 2025. I don't know about 2025. Got the name right. Yeah, 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 yeah. 90th anniversary of DC, 40th anniversary of Crisis on Infinite Earths, and 20th anniversary of Infinite Crisis. That wow. could be it. <laughs> wow, yeah. So they better yeah. get started. <laughs> uh, damn, that's a great title. Absolute crisis. Woo. Uh, <laughs> all right. So yeah, I, I like, I like the idea in a general sense of them existing in the same multiverse, but not if it means that they're going to have no restraint and keep themselves from just barreling into, and not even just major crossover. I don't even want to see, you know, like the flash looking at a mirror and seeing, yeah. you know, the other flag. I don't want that to happen right away. Yeah. I don't want to see the, the characters that can travel multiverses doing that. Like yeah, exactly. And dude, that's a great, that's a great point, right? There are a lot of characters that very easily find themselves, you know, somewhere in the multiverse. Yeah. We, we, I think that even that should be, there should be a kind of Wakanda. Wakanda, it's invisible yeah. in the multiverse. <laughs> yeah, no one can see it. We didn't. No know one it can was go there. Wow, the monitor didn't even know that would. Now that would be something that would really bring some hype to the the old school DC heads. Yeah, the monitor didn't even know it was there. Whoa, that's a big deal. Yeah, 
If I'm into that. It's still around. I'm not even positive he is. There's the dude. They can always yeah. drudge up a monitor, right? It's like the watcher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's up there. Don't worry. <laughs> um, the last time I saw the watcher, he was sad. Remember, um, what was that book uh, Original Sin? Yeah, I think. Yeah, that was the last time I I think I saw the watcher. He went out sad. That was when he was dead, wasn't he? Right. Yeah. 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 He so, lost his eye. He was killed. Yeah, I guess that is tracks. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you're just tuning in, thank you for hanging out. A lot of you uh, watching right now. Rich Johnson's name is in the title. Unfortunately, we don't know where he is right now. Um, if we can't get him on today, we'll get him on another day. It's no big deal. Uh, but we are still continuing to have the conversation about Absolute DC Comics. If you are enjoying it and hanging out with us, make sure you smash that like button. Smash. Whether you are live with us or in the future, we appreciate you being here and hanging out. Super Chats are open. You can join the channel by clicking the Join button. Uh, if you want to support us further and become a channel member, thanks for hanging out either way. Uh, Comic Boom says, My attraction to the idea of an ultimate DC line is associated with their characters. I do not want an absolute event. Keep the story's character driven for at least the first few years. I agree. Agreed. Yeah. Unfortunately, the absolute crisis has to happen though. So, um, and that's, you know, 2025 isn't a long way off. Dude, I said I was done with bets, right? And I am, but if I were a betting man, cause I'm not anymore. I would put money on the fact that by the by the year 2030 there will be an event called Absolute Crisis. I think the name the name's a no-brainer. That's done. Yeah. Uh but the um but the um 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 uh, the, I think the, the timing is what's in, in question. Yeah. I'm and like, that that literally comes down to DC's restraint. Um, the crazy, amazing J man says, you guys bring up a good point. At what point does the DC multiverse stop multiversing? It never stops. It never stops. Never stops. They, they have to. And I mean, you know, the multiverse is cool. Like they get a lot of value out of it. They, they use it. Um, but I think we're sort of multiversed out. It's been a lot. And especially if they want to make this a credible thing that people will care about, we all know they're going to cross over. That's the whole point of a second universe. Yeah. The the control, like you, know, like you say, the control, the self-control is going to be the hard part and making that a story worth telling. Exactly. Exactly. It can't feel like a cash grab. Everybody's trying to make money. There's nothing wrong with that. But it can't feel like it only exists for the sake of that. It has to feel creative. It has to feel fresh. Um, I mean, to me, when I was reading the New 52 as it was ro rolling out, I wouldn't say I had the feeling that this was like, you know, oh man, editorial took over this whole thing. I wasn't that tapped into the industry, but I certainly knew it was weird as hell that Green Lantern and Batman didn't relaunch. Yeah. But everything else did, right? Right. Which is a decision you only make because those books were doing so well. And and it it felt bad. Because like like Batman and Green Lantern were, you know, like you say, they were the best sellers at the time. So it was obvious that's what was going on. But the Flash had started over mm -hmm. with the new 52. So, you know, why did that history reset for them, but not him? And it just felt like it felt janky. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and then I think in a way. Not that this was the you know mission statement, but I think in a way this kind of redeems the experience that the creators had on working on New Fifty Two. That's there will be one day guaranteed a deep dive into the New Fifty Two that we do, because we all know what it felt like to read the New Fifty Two, 
But what it felt like to work on the new 52 behind the scenes is a completely different experience. And the frustration that fans felt, creators were feeling doubly so working on that thing. Can you imagine? Ghost Machine gets far enough and Jeff gets far enough away that he can go, okay, let me give you some dirt. And you I want it. And you imagine. I want it. And I uh did he not tell us a little something once? I feel like there was yeah, uh, yeah, once there was a lit just a little thing. Yeah. Um I would have to say, like we've we've all speculated about when the pals would have peaked. I think it'll be that moment. That'll be the time when it's like, oh, the pals? No, no, they had to quit because they found out the the whole dirt on the new 52 and there's nowhere else to go. That's it for me. That and 5G. I'll tell you when I'm done with this show. (laughs) I'm done with this show when I have received so much information about DC 5G that I can plot it from beginning to end. That's what I need. I need that 5G shit dripping into my veins. Not because I think that the stories were so great, but because I'm fascinated by the fact that all this planning went into this shit and it did not happen. Like, yeah. man, Dan Didio put in a lot of effort. Um, Cole says, I'm tired of crises, but absolute crisis has to happen. That title is hard. Yeah, MP. MP, the MVP. Um... Uh, Matt Murphy says, need to put that betting money on a KC Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl three-peat. I'd probably see my money quicker, right? Yeah. Although three-peats <laughs> are very difficult to do. Um, Comic Boom says, the irony with DC is that it has a multiverse, but rarely has ongoing titles that focus on any of the Earth 52 or larger hyper time. Earth 2 and Earth series and minis notwithstanding. Because of confusion. I would imagine. And and once you get into that hyper time stuff, like it's so mysterious and so vague that once you personify it, it loses its appeal. And it's, you know, it's it's that it's the personification of if you pull that thread, that sweater's gonna unravel. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um the MP says, interesting to to imagine what would have happened had the New 52 been a separate universe. In retrospect, knowing what I know now about comics and everything else, yeah. Yeah. I think that DC at the time, for me, felt a little bit... A li- like a little bit impenetrable. And it could just be the the perspective that I had. Kale, I would love for you to speak to this because you were way more connected to what DC was doing at the time. But for me, it felt like if it wasn't Batman or Green Lantern, it was very difficult to get into what DC was doing. Um, all the characters were, you know, I mean, Final Crisis was like, what even is happening right now? I don't understand this. Yeah. With, yeah, especially with, regard to final crisis like i i was reading dc before infinite crisis um i really got in maybe i think batman hush just came out when i got into dc mm. so you know at the at for me at the time it was like okay find a number one and you know pick a character you like and go on and that's where I got in, you know, the the majority of it was Johns's uh Teen Titans. You know, so it was uh, you know, I knew I've always liked Robin. Um, the Teen Titans show fueled that, and you know, that that cover of Robin, Starfire, Cyborg, Raven, Beast Boy, and then Wonder Girl, Superboy, Impulse, maybe go, oh, ooh, hold on a second. They're not in the Teen Titans. What's going on here? And that was where like the whole thing exploded for me. So it was it was very much like, you know, for me, like that's that's why my most of my attitude is like pick a character, pick a number one, get on it. But uh, you know, being so baked in and then going through the the crises, um, and then hitting that hard reboot was uh very difficult. Yeah, I, I think that 
that that as a as a way to freshen things up is just not effective. I just yeah. don't I just don't think it's very effective. And I think the new 52 would have been a lot better had it been something completely separate. But I think that the top end of DC at that time felt like, in fact, I know they felt like this because we talked about this. Dan said this video. Yeah. Um, DC was done. Like things were bad. Things were in the gutters yeah. and they needed something yeah. drastic. Yeah. And that's what they did. Well, and uh, a big part of that, like what was so much worse was that final crisis being final wasn't final and it wasn't actually like what caused the shift you know yeah. like even after final crisis which i reiterate was final like batman died in the middle of that and then came back and then you know the um and then flashpoint happened and it was like well you know, the oh, and Black as Night was still going. So, like, in the middle of all this, there was so much that was going on. Like, why, why couldn't we have ended it after Final Crisis and then pivoted? Right. That, that would have made sense. And, right. even, and even if you had um, kept Green Lantern and Batman at a certain point, you know, in their lives or whatever, there certainly could have been you know an explanation that would have fit better than what they cooked up with flashpoint totally uh just to let you guys know rich is going to be joining us here in a moment he just reached out to us so he is going to be coming on um nice. thank you for hanging out with us i really really appreciate everybody's patience and you know as much as we've discussed there's still a lot more to dive into and with the man himself. So I'm very excited for it. If you have questions for Rich, drop them in the comments section. We will get to as many as we can uh, throughout our conversation with him. Uh, let's hit a few more comments uh, while we wait for him to jump on board. Um, he says, uh, I think DC kind of killed their pre-New 52 universe with identity crisis. And everything that tried to heal the universe after that just made things worse. I, I could see that. Because one thing about DC was their beloved sort of C and D list characters, right? Mm. And the face of that being Ralph and Sue Dibney, who Identity Crisis was about. They killed Sue Dibney, they raped Sue Dibney, and then Ralph, I think Ralph died mysteriously somewhere. And then they were brought back during 52 for reasons right let me just stop you rich is joining us right this minute so i'm gonna let him Let's into go. the let him into the room rich can you, you can hear us i can hear you can you hear me yes just... absolutely just letting you know we are live right now so you are that's be live you are live and in living color. We are joined now by one of, in my opinion, one of the greatest comics journalists that has ever been in comics. Side someone side. who is, of course, someone who has been in this industry for 30 plus years, has seen it all, done it all. Bleeding Cool is one of my favorite websites, one of the leading websites when it comes to reporting and reporting news, but not just copy pasting what you get in an email um, that the solicitations actually doing journalism work, actually diving in and learning about things that are happening behind the scenes. One of the best at that. We are joined by Rich Johnson. Thank you for coming on with us. Hey there. That was quite an introduction. That was quite a uh, Don't use the J word. I do not self-identify as a journalist. Oh, oh. Right. oh <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. It's, like, it's, like, it's like one of those things. Lovely to see you guys. Um, yeah, it's uh, that, I, that was really nice. Uh, my wife is sitting nearby, and I think she was quite impressed by that introduction. That was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> I, I I do something similar when I, I have my wife big me up like that to my in-laws. 
oh, well, you know, they got a lot of subscribers when they go online. They are getting paid now. There we go. <laughs> so, what are we talking? So, we're talking absolute DC. You have done an incredible job of reporting on this. Just since the start. Just the start. There's a lot more to come. Oh, and I can't wait to get in on that. So (laughs) this all started around New York Comic Con 2023. I remember that. I want to say it was maybe that weekend or shortly after your first article went up. Now, we we were at New York Comic Con and we heard, and this is the reason why I believe so (laughs) easily what you're reporting, because I can't say who it was, but someone who would know also told us that this was a thing. Yeah. while we were at the event and i can tell you who that was when we're not on the air okay. but <laughs> i i because of that i firmly believe it so when you report on this when you talk about absolute dc are you absolutely confident that there that this is happening yes 100 percent. i've been confident about it for quite some time i've just been having to negotiate get the deals get the wording um there's all sorts of people who have got their own certain sensibilities that I have to take care of the lots of sources I have to uh, abide by when they let me do stuff. If I get information from a source and they say, you can't run this now, you can only run it in two months' time or someone will know who it, who it was, that kind of thing. Uh. I'm very happy to, I'll always hold things until it's a good time. And then just recently, and then just little drops of information kind of all kind of coalesced together. And it was like, ah, oh, okay, there we go. We're running the story. So we did. Uh, but this is the first of many. And there's more stuff going down now. I'm starting to get some details about creative teams or creators involved. I need, I want to, I need to check them and double check them before I start running things. But uh, yeah, it's it's all it's all coming through. This is a definitely, this is definitely happening. I mean, I say it's definitely happening. I mean, five G was also definitely happening. <laughs> that always changed. People can get fired. People lose jobs. New people come in. They say we don't want absolute nonsense. Not having any of this. So. Um, Things can always change. I was going to say up until the press release, but no, even after the press release, things can still change. So, um, yeah, as it stands, I'm utterly convinced that this is what's happening until it doesn't. As, as, such, as such as it is in comics, that is, yeah, yeah, totally. And everything, to be fair, this is not entirely, this is not unique to comics. This is the kind of stuff um, that goes all over, I mean, again, entertainment coverage, but also pretty much everything as well in life. Um, governments announce things that they suddenly they suddenly don't do anymore. Um, everyone's there's there's all sorts of levels of information and things change all the time. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 very fair. Um, should we be thinking about this absolute DC? Is it is it an ultimate universe fresh start with yes. creator driven stories? Yes. I mean, it might actually be closer to what's actually happening with the Ultimate Comics at Marvel right now, when you've got um, a much stronger kind of creative drive and difference to the titles in the way that you have something like um, Ultimate X-Men being very different to Ultimate Spider-Man, yet existing in the same kind of universe. They right. kind of work together, but they're, they are different. They're, they're strong auteur versions of these characters. I mean, Ultimate X-Men is Peach Momoko doing her thing. And the background ties in a bit with what's going on over in uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. They're doing uh, real-time comics. So the idea is for all the new Ultimate books, every month a book is published, um, is another month in that universe. And that hasn't been done for a while. So um, that's that's what Marvel is doing. And this is got a bit close to that, probably with a few more titles. Mm. And um, yeah, it's going to, as we can tell, it's going to be a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of titles coming out. They'll be all within their own shared continuity but there'll be radical new takes on the familiar DC characters that we know. So I'm expecting Batman, I'm expecting Superman, I'm expecting, you know, Wonder Woman, but I'm also expecting some left field choices as well, things you might not have have expected. So other characters who maybe don't have their own book at the moment will suddenly find they've got themselves an absolute book. Um, in the That's Ultimate exciting. way that um, Ultimate book. Book, wow. Black Panther, I don't think people expected that for the new Ultimate line. There'll be similar titles coming from... Uh, Absolute comics again. There'll be uh, characters who think, "Oh, I wasn't expecting that," and that's because the creator in, in question will have had a big idea about how to use a B list, C list, D list character, and they'll be getting their own absolute book. Absolutely, and that's right, that man. stuff I'm just hearing now. So I, they, I haven't even run this yet. So you're getting that, that you're getting that aspect of it first. But we'll see okay. more. I I love Rich. 
one thing I love on this podcast is an exclusive. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank my, you. So won't be happy with that, but there we go. That's all right. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, all right. So you you put out two articles so far. One that was sort of the big initial drop about absolute. Yes. And then a follow-up article where you yes. elaborated. And That's I thought that that was incredible. Um, and you talked about how this is going to absolute DC is going to actually exist within the same universe as mainline in the I, multiverse. They're basically thinking of it, I think, as Earth One and Earth Two. Yeah, and the way that used to be used back in the kind of the sixties and seventies and stuff. And I think that's going to be the model. I that's, I feel that's what's going to be. I haven't been told this, but from everything that I've been explained to, to me, that's kind of the model. So there's going to be your Earth. You're going to be at your DC, Prime Earth, whatever you want to call that. And then there's going to be absolute comics, and it'll be a new take on the characters. And at some time, there's going to be a bleed through. Now that didn't really happen with the Ultimate Comics, for like, not not in the, not in the uh, early days kind of thing. It was. Yeah. I remember uh, Brian Bendis talking about it. he didn't even see it as a separate universe. It was not something completely different outside of everything. It was outside of any kind of multiverse. That's not the case with DC. There's a plan. There's some kind of plan. I don't know how it's going to be integrated. Is there going to be crossovers? Is there going to be some aspect? Whatever, no, it's like a storytelling plan. Um, it's almost like the way that uh, Jonathan Hickman, again, started the new Ultimate Comics. He did it from the existing mm -hmm. um, Marvel Universe. Now, I don't know how that's, if it's going to be something similar with the DC's version, but there's definitely an idea of planning going on. And Scott Snyder um, is the showrunner. This is, all the, this is all his baby. All the creators may be doing their own thing, kind of, but he's going to be keeping an eye over everything and make sure everything kind of like ties in together. It'll be a a laissez-faire kind of approach, I expect, from what I understand. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it should be quite exciting. Certainly, I think they'll be having wanting big names and big creators on these books, and they want to make a big splash when they hit. Whatever changes they'll be making to the characters, I expect will be radical ones, headline-worthy ones, stuff that will get on the front pages of various newspapers. They want to make a big kind of media impact, I guess, in a way that the new 52 did. I mean, this is not going to be like the entire line. This is going to be for these books and it's going to be part of the DC All In. And that's the new name of that. That's basically the, what comes after Dawn of DC is DC All In. And that's going to be the name for whatever it is. All the books, all the titles running together, including the absolute line, is going to be uh, DC All In. And that's uh, I think that's coming from Scott as well. So, yeah, it should be fun. So DC All In DC is... All In. I feel like no one is talking about this and I don't know why everyone is so focused on the absolute DC part. No one's talking about all in right. this is so this is the, the initiative to follow Dawn of DC, but it encompasses, it encompasses not yes. just mainline, but also this absolute. I'm also, I mean, I don't know, but I would guess elseworlds as well is to be part of that. You. I don't know. That feels like the idea of this being an all encompassing thing. So, um, yeah, this is going to be basically DC's new publishing initiative, I guess, for late 2024, 2025. I don't know the times, but that feels like it sits. This feels like the, the San Diego announcement for New York Comic Con time publishing. Or it's a San Diego tease, New York Comic Con announcement and 2025 publishing. It could be that as well. Um, again, I'm working with... Um, it's one of my, what, I think the, the bleeding... Well, certainly my trick has always been I have some crumbs... And sometimes that makes people think I've got the whole loaf. And, I'm, right. and I don't abuse them with that situation. <laughs> but uh, that is always true. I've got little bits. And I'm trying right. to piece them together and see what I can get. I'm not, it's almost like an archaeologist of the future. Put it that way. You, can, you get all these little bones and you try to put them together and you go, oh, right, this is what this dinosaur looks like. And sometimes you get it totally wrong. But you're actually, right. you're, you're working from what you have. And every now and then you get a new bit. And you can put that in. And you go, oh, no. Though I thought those were his legs. Turns out they were his arms, and it's facing the wrong way around. I don't want that ever have to happen again. So, you know, these things do come, but it's, it's part of the job, part of the fun. Uh, people have called the kind of stuff that I do, um, and other writers do, this is the first draft of history, and there will be many more drafts to come. But this is where it starts. <laughs> I love it. And it is weird. Actually, I admit, it is weird. That I put all this stuff together about the American superhero comic book publishing industry from a house in southwest London in England. It's weird. It's always been weird. hasn't stopped being weird. Um, but it does mean that I'm less likely to bump into someone who's got a problem with what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, New York or, or LA, it might be a bit harder. It might be 
But uh, yeah, it, it seems to work. There's a certain distance, which I also think I think helps when people talk to me because they feel they're sure. not talking to someone around the block. They're talking to someone on the other side of the world, even though these days that doesn't make a difference. But yeah, it works. Exactly. The world is smaller than ever. Do you do you often find that there are creators who are maybe like averse to you because yeah. of okay. Yes. Very much averse to me. Um to all in all sorts of ways. There are hundred percent. Um although you know I always flash back to that scene in um apps um almost famous where the guy's being told by the uh by Hoffman it's the uh, you do not go into this business to make friends. These mm. are not your friends. And this is kind of what it is. I'm reporting on the business, the industry, my audience are the readers. Um so I'm not doing this to make friends with with kind of creators or publishers. I mean, I have along the way, but that's incidental. And um, also, if I shall say this, yeah, I'll say this. There are some people who are very, very publicly anti-me online, and that's very fine because they just send me stuff. But this is just their way of covering it. Now, I can say that because there's so many people who have me, so you, you, you never guess who. But there are definitely some people who cover that. A couple guys. of names oh, in mind. What a terrible, terrible person is. Rich, more people know need to know about this. Can you tell these obviously didn't come from me? Oh, that Rich Johnson, what a terrible person. And I'm happy to play along with that. I love it. So wow. there's a there's a kayfabe to, to it all. Um, yeah. There is. I mean, this is, yeah, yeah, to some degree, I guess. Um, it's not, a, it's not, I know that that's a wrestling term for the kind of like um, the, the, the fiction that everyone yeah. can play yeah. with. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's quite that, but there's definitely um, an idea that people want to cover their tracks of it. And I understand that completely. That's fine. Well, especially, especially when so much of like the, the broader media landscape of this stuff revolves around massive secrecy. There's a, yeah, people, there's NDAs all over the place. Yeah. Um, it was quite fun. When I first ran some uh, comment, uh, gossip about the upcoming X-Men books and a label, and then talked about a bunch of new creators coming in. And I, of course, before I do that, I will contact people and say, I'm about to run the story, just so you know, heads up. If you want to say anything, you can. And for the first time, certain people who I was emailing didn't respond to me. Mm. Not even a, yeah, thanks, Richard, thanks for the heads up. Obviously, I can't say anything. None of that. And it's like, oh, well, that's interesting. So th- these couple of people who are normally very, very chatty are suddenly not saying anything at all to me. It's like, oh, okay. Mm. And that, I know, is the that's the Marvel um you can't say anything to the media about this at all. If anyone asks you, just shut up. And yeah, DC are doing the same. So mm. which is, I, I'm fine with, because to some degree, I can work with negative space. If if people normally respond, don't respond, I can go, oh, well, that's definitely true then. Um, but there's also an as, a aspect of this is this is the way it works. And I'm quite happy to, to work, work in this game. The more I find that people press down from above, more the, the PR side or the... Uh, or the legal side, whatever, press it down from above and silences people, the more things can like come out the sides, they can leak out the sides. And that's where I am standing with my hands open, ready to receive the drips. <laughs> I love and that. Then, and that's what I do. It's quite fun. <laughs> and there's been a lot of that this week. So it's been, yeah, it's, it's, it's been entertaining. More to come, more to come. I'm glued. I, I, I'm refreshing <laughs> the website every day. Um... Oh, well, I, I, I can't tell you every day, but there the will there will be this stuff. Also, I do a thing just in case you don't want to actually have to do that. Um, I do a, like a, a daily email which kind of runs through the most read stories on Bleeding Cool the previous day uh, called Lying in the Gutters. And if anyone signs up for that, they'll get it at I think uh, I think it's something like six a.m. New York time. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. I, again, as you found out today, I'm not totally up to date with the current uh, time zone differences. So apologies for that. Um, no but yes, that, that that can be signed up on the website, and then that gets quite a lot of people who just kind of like they just want to see. What the biggest stories were yesterday so you can catch up and that's quite popular so you guys heard it if you want to stay connected to what rich is doing and what the other writers are doing on bleedingcool.com make sure that you are subscribed to lying in the gutters which is i'm assuming sort of your newsletter where everybody yeah. can get caught up up to date with what's going on on the website to me if you want to know what is going to happen not just what has been announced to happen then you need to be visiting this website and and I, I I understand that there are people who would rather not know the inside baseball of it all and kind of just want to see things as Marvel, DC, Image, whoever decides it's time for them to see them. But I'd like to know what's coming. It makes it kind of fun. 
the speculation. Well, some people don't even want to know when Marvel and DC want them to know as well. Um, I think it was Kieran Gillen who talked about how there are some people who have no idea what's coming in a comic. They don't even read the solicitations. They have nothing until they pick it up, and that at which point they're surprised. So there's nothing that happens online which will ever spoil anything because they don't read any of this stuff anyway. And I think he used an ex- there was one example. I did want to do a story where I got an advanced copy of the next day's Young Avengers, and it had the new look for Loki as a as a young man, and a new, no longer a young boy, but a young man. And I happened to be going to the Avengers two premiere in the in the press pack, and I saw Tom uh, Tom Hiddleston in the in the distance, and I kind of leapt over the barriers, dodged a couple of Disney security cars, went up to him and said, "I've got the new. Do you want to see the new look of Loki?" And he kind of like pushed me. Oh yeah, yeah. I got a photo of him with a new look of Loki the day before it was in the shops, and that. Well, I know it broke Tumblr, um, and yeah. I think that only time that Kieran did a kind of a Damn you, Richard! That spoiler has now reached everyone yeah. because he stapled to um, a Hollywood A-lister's chest, and I believe uh, he said it went around the internet at the speed of lust. Um, and so that's the one time he said that's the only time a spoiler's ever actually got anywhere that maybe it shouldn't have done, as far as he's concerned, at least. And um, I, I don't know. I, I think I think Marvel in the end were quite happy with that one because it, at, the, at the time it blo- it broke Tumblr, which back then was was, was a thing. Uh, listen, it's still a thing. I was on Tumblr at the time. Thank you for that. You wiped out a week of my existence that week. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, by the way, I'm a big Tumblr fan. That's the other thing. Tumblr is a great place to find stuff that other people aren't, don't know is there. I, I scour Tumblr for stuff because that's going up yeah. there without people noticing it. And I've definitely picked up one or two stories in the last couple of months because someone's posted on Tumblr and no one else has seen it. That's why I try to go. I try and go places where other people aren't looking. Um, and uh, huh. and that's a place where you can pick up stuff that uh, isn't being controlled as much. Um, so uh, you know th- that 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 can of course then change. But um, yeah, uh, it's also I mean, there, are, there are some places that. Um, okay, I, I will say one thing: if you're looking for big future spoilers, don't look on 4chan because sorry, that is the absolute because it is so anonymous. People can and do post absolute nonsense just to see how far it will spread yeah. and occasionally i'll run it if it's amusing enough but uh, in terms of reliability 4chan is not the place for us for for leaks and stuff but tumblr yeah that could be i love that tumblr is actually a, a legitimate source but i mean there are people in the industry who have tumblr accounts that are sort of low-key yeah and Absolutely. they've since I follow them all since uh you know the the musk takeover of twitter like several have gone back that's true but again that would be that would be the other thing there's also like a move different move towards uh blue sky as well a little bit mm-hmm. towards threads some people start to ignore twitter well that'd be good for me because i'll still be there looking um there will be stuff and i will do my best to gather it and bring it to the readers that's that's the aim um I'm some, yeah even even this morning i'm looking at some stuff i'm having to well, the nice thing about twitter is it's got this automatic um translation system that it has going you can automatically translate stuff that's posted onto twitter it seems so um currently i'm looking at some portuguese comments about the recent uh ai dc comics controversy and there's some very interesting stuff there that happens to be in portuguese uh. so i'm very happy that twitter's translating it for me and that might be a story uh, in the next couple of days uh. yeah because uh the the ai covers that dc was going to run just allegedly. Got pulled. Allegedly. allegedly ai the artist in question denies it Right. And it's put up, but a lot of people have looked at it and gone, no, that's clearly AI. That's their opinion. But it's so much of a thing that DC have decided, yeah, we're going to pull these covers and replace them with other covers. And so now, now like Dave Johnson and Cully Hamner and the likes have just got a bit of extra work. So, hey, worked out. Um, I don't know. There's, there's, the artist in question is saying um, they were just pulled because of the controversy. It's, but I, they're definitely not AI. Um, so we're gonna see how well that goes. There's also there's, it's it's right now it's the big accusation stuff. You can accuse someone of doing AI and that will destroy them in the creative industry, whether they have or they haven't. Yeah. But I'm certainly following this argument. I mean, again, I think this is gonna happen. People are gonna get falsely accused of AI. People who are working, especially digitally, um, they're gonna to have to start doing a more taking account of their process. We need to show interstitials of our work, kind of thing. Um it's quite handy on, I mean, I do a lot of my own artwork. I, I'm a political cartoonist in the UK and I use a lot of my work. I do it on um, on, on the very iPad that 
I'm doing this through now, and on, on Procreate. And that's got a nice little, um, let's show every line that you've drawn. So you can turn your drawing into an animation of it being drawn. I mean, to be fair, um, most AI can draw a lot better than I can. So um, it's really not going to be that dumbed down for, for, for <laughs> uh, But it's a useful thing to be able to show. If anyone ever wants to see, I can literally show not only every line, but all the photographs that I copied. So when, when drawing the cartoon. So yeah, it should, it's all that. It's all transparent. That might have to be more of a thing for more artists, I think. I agree. And I think you're going to have to worry when they start making accusations of your articles being AI written. Oh, that always happens now. I mean, because, <laughs> it, it, I think, I don't know. I've been, I, I thought in my little smug way that like being a reporter, I was immune from AI because the stuff that I'm running, no one knows about. This is AI is all about generating stuff that already exists, but I'm bringing in information that isn't known to anyone else at the time. And then I saw the most recent Mission Impossible film, and I went, oh, no, wait a minute. All an AI has to do is generate the right question and then ask it to 2,000 people simultaneously. You're creating a voice, phoning people up, asking that question, and in one of those 2,000 people, they might get the answer, and they can turn that into a story. So there is a possibility for me to be utterly, utterly destroyed by AI. Uh, you just have to be quite a clever program. But yeah, I looked at that. I, it was literally, I thought there was being smug. I had to watch a Mission Impossible film to realize that I might actually be wrong about what AI could do, or what AI could be. And once I start to think about that, then you start to think about all the, how many, however many people are going to get conned and stuff. The idea, if, 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 if AI can actually replicate your voice from 20 seconds conversation, then it can be you. So I, there could be an AI that could just be, basically be Rich Johnston have a, get something off the internet, some a, a, a allegation, and then ask ten thousand comic book creators in my voice about it, and then run the results. That could happen. So, yeah, I mean, maybe actually, do you know what? If it wants a reliable answer, maybe you shouldn't use my voice. Maybe you should use someone that people <laughs> like. That, uh, but you know, th th there are there are possibilities out there. It's going to be interesting. Well, let's let's take things back to absolute DC here for oh, a little yes. bit. Um, there was a bit of a tangent there, wasn't there? I apologize. No, it's okay. I, trust me, I'm 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 on the hook. Um, so you talked about this being a new initiative, and Dawn yeah. of DC is. I mean, we're what like a couple years into it, a year into yeah. it. So, do you feel that given that initiative's focus on you know fresh characters and stories and creator driven stories and not top down stuff? Do you feel that this is the right time to start a new initiative? Well, I think possibly. I mean, I, I run every week. I'm um, working on it right now. The uh, top, I do a top 10 bestselling comics of the week from in, from reported from comic book stores. And while if Batman is out that week, it will be Batman. That's genuinely the only book you can guarantee will be in that top 10 um, from DC that week. There's a couple of others that come in, Action Comics, Birds of Prey. That I think kind of done so better than a lot of people thought, um, but generally it's dominated by Marvel and by um, the Transformers GI Joe comics from Image, mm. and those are basically taking out most of the slots. Okay, occasionally another DC title will get in, but they're not getting the um, the titles that they might have done a few years ago. So definitely, I think there looks like comparatively at least there's a bit of a sales slip on the monthly comics. And so they might want to do something that re-energizes, gets fans um, very excited about again. Um, and maybe they're not quite getting there at the moment. I mean, this is you know this is a, a problem for all sorts of people right now. But this looks like it might be DC's uh, solution. Also, not only to get um, readers involved, but also to keep creators on board. There's mm -hmm. a battle for creators right now as well. Um, Jeff Johns did not do DC Comics any favors <laughs> by bringing some like four or five of their top artists and making them not only doing books, but making them exclusive to Ghost Machine through Image. Um, so yeah, DC have just lost um, Brian Hitch and Gary Frank and Jason uh, Fabok and a bunch of others uh, and, and Jeff Johns himself. So um, yeah, they're, so they, they're having to find something to keep creators interested as well as readers interested. So that you, you always look at this, this is something aimed at readers. It's also something aimed at creators. You can be a part of this big reinvention of a classic um, DC comic book character. And that's the kind of thing that might entice a few people away from their creator-owned work, say, just for a bit. We'll come back and do a couple of years on this book, 
while I'm also got my big my, my big name creator own book elsewhere, which is so the creator own books. If you're a big name artist or writer, creator own books will make you more money than Marvel and DC generally. However, it may be that a big Marvel and DC book is very good for your branding and will get you other creators who you can then maybe move a few of them over to your creator own line. So it's almost like you advertise yourself by writing Batman or drawing Batman for a couple of years. It's almost like this is your, you're, you're putting out into the world how good you are because you'll get a lot more sales of these comics. And this is, I think, absolutely going to sell very well. It's going to get a lot of this stuff out there. So certainly for advertising, for branding, it's going to be very good for any creator who gets those slots. And if they've got any nows, they'll then use that um, attention and then launch their own book from Image, Boom, Vault, whoever, Substack, Kickstarter, off the back of that. And that, I think, is looking like the new model for a comic book creator's career. Oh, and then when they sell it as a, as a, as a movie. Yeah, always throw that in there as well. Got to remember <laughs> that. Um, but, you know, you, you look at these things, and there are some creators who have actually found this as this is the way they don't I mean, You look at even like someone like Mark Miller, who's had such success with um, working at Netflix and getting his his comic books and films as well. I mean, even he's been talking about coming back to doing Superman. And I think partly of that is he needs to remind certain people who used to buy his his DC books that he still exists. Because some people won't know. Some people actually won't know. And this is a good way to kind of bring him back. We'll see. I think, but I think Absolute Comics is going to be superb for that kind of thing. There'll be creators either returning to DC or coming to DC for the first time and doing something explosive with these characters um, in, a, in a way that, that very much kind of like set for now. The idea, I think, is going to be what if Batman was created now? What if Superman was created now? What are the aspects of the world that would be reflected in their creation? I'm going to see that. I, I, I think that's going to be quite as you know, ongoing stories that could be interlaced between each other. I, I, you know, I'm a big superhero fan, um, always have been, and this is exactly the kind of thing I'd love to read. Rich, you, you mentioned maybe getting new creators to DC that DC hasn't really seen before. Um, yeah. we saw that Al Ewing was yes uh, on the DC Pride just randomly at DC I all point, of a sudden. Yeah, I pointed that out at the time. It's like, oh. There's Al. The thing is, okay, what I know of Al, um, I mean, people who've been reading his Marvel work know his deep dives into Marvel history. Going back to the 30s, mm-hmm. he's bringing up characters and concepts that have been forgotten and, in, and you know, linking them all together. Whether he's When you can get characters from the first Marvel comics book uh, from 1930, whatever, and then also line them up with the Beyonder version, the, the, from the original Secret Wars version of the Beyonder, and everything else he's been, doing. he's been creating a huge big history for marvel integrating all these aspects into it but from what i understand from what i know from al he's not that much of a big marvel fan not back in the day he's a really big dc fan and so if he gets the chance to do something like that for dc i think people are going to be astounded and amazed i've been checking i do not believe he is um again this might be an exclusive view uh, i do not believe he's uh, exclusive to marvel anymore he was I don't think he is now. Um, hence why we've got a book from coming in DC Pride. And yet if I was Marie Javins or Scott Snyder or whoever, I'd be wanting Al Ewing to do that kind of thing for DC. Because from what I understand, his level of knowledge of DC exceeds that of the like of uh, Mark Wade, Kurt Busiek. He brings out stuff that no one knows about and that he has a massive passion for. So it's going to be very much that kind of like revitalising a huge amount of DC stuff, that some of which you'll know, and some of which you won't. And if Al has a chance to do that for DC, it's going to be incredible. Because it's what he really loves. He loves wow. DC. Right. Again, about, again not, not just his Marvel stuff, his 2000 AD stuff as well is also extraordinary, and his yeah. books for, for vaults, things like that. There's, some, there's huge amounts of work that, if, if you want to prepare yourself for Al Ewing doing stuff for DC, there's a good lot of stuff to get, to get excited about by reading. More of an encyclopedia than Kurt Busiek and Mark Wade. That's kind of what I'm thinking from every from the conversations I've had with him and with other people who talked to him. I mean, maybe that's maybe that's an exaggeration. I don't know, but that's certainly the kind of area we're talking about. I mean, so, they're um, they're big, like. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So it's so it's that that kind of level we're talking about. And you're right, yeah, kids, yeah. Wade does that a lot, but Al's obsessed by this stuff. I mean, this yeah. again, 
the stuff that we've, if you've been reading his Marvel work and the stuff he was doing on Venom, which was in, extraordinary, oh most my God. by me, folding in on itself thing I've seen, yeah. that also brought in characters that almost everyone had forgotten from those 1930s Marvel books um, and then tying them in with, with, with Venom. I was not expecting that mm. at all. But this is the stuff that he just kind of pulls out of his head, pulls off his shelf. So, yeah, it's going to be good. And also, he just writes really well. Alf, yeah. Al's writing is extraordinarily good. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, DC fans should be very excited if uh, Al, uh, Al Ewing is indeed coming to DC. I mean, all the signs are that he is, I would say. So we have a lot of people that are very excited that you're here right now. Ooh. and have questions and i want to okay. make sure <laughs> i want to make oh. sure that we get to some of them okay. uh about absolute dc so while okay. we're still in this portion so uh atomic hound asked a couple of questions he said any guesses as to when we will see the first solicits and how many titles do we expect okay i would expect solicits it's a guess we'd be talking um for like october Publication is a guess. October, November publication. So it'd be like two or three months before then. I would expect to know about them for San Diego. Unless things get delayed. Things may well get delayed. And in that case, you might only get the solicit solicits around October, November in time for 2025. So we'll see. It's tw So basically either we'll get the first hints at the end of July or we'll start to see the solicits running in about October, November. That would be my expectation. One of those two. Okay, thank you for answering oh, sorry, that. But number books, no, sorry, number books. Um, I think this is what I've again. It's 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 hard to get. I've, I've got diff, I've got conflicting information. I think we'd be looking at six titles initially, and whether they'll keep a six titles for that, or they'll, they'll swap them out with other books. I don't know whether these are going to be mini series or ongoing. I don't know. Um, there's lots of I don't know, but I think six is what I've heard. Not okay. 52. <laughs> not 52 <laughs> but like I said it, it's, but no, the, DC is a different company than it was in 2011 it has half the editorial staff it had then uh, we're not seeing 52 of anything well especially not staff members <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so Superman Batman Wonder uh, yeah. Woman I would I would feel that you have to have the Trinity absolutely right. beyond there we could start guessing. We could say Flash, Green Lantern, Aquaman, maybe. I don't know. Right, I, said, I know there's one completely... I don't know what it is. I know there's one completely left card, so I don't know who that would be. But, um, I don't, I mean, if I was me, I would suggest, oh, how about someone like Plastic Man or Martian yeah. Manhunter? Or, I don't know, someone who's like who's, who's got less of a strong role traditionally and will, but will have a big book, Blue Beetle. I don't know. Um, so, mm. But this is just me guessing. This is just me throwing out names. So please don't get too excited. Anyone anyway, who suddenly believes there's going to be a Plastic Man book, I don't know that. <laughs> but that who is, has a certain amount of knowledge of him, and DC fans, is not as well known in the world. Certainly had some exposure, but is not, you know, he's not going to be, he's not going to be someone completely uh, off left field, but it's, I think it's going to be um, someone you would not expect to be part of this book, or part of this line, in the way that I think Ultimate Black Panther was for the new Ultimate line. He wouldn't have been your most natural choice. Some people would have gone for, I don't know, um, an Ultimate Iron Man first. So, sure. but then, mm -hmm. and it's that kind of thinking. They just, well, they just want to try and mix up a bit. And with the James Gunn movies coming out too, I would think they might want to have some characters that they've announced there. That would be useful, like wouldn't it? But um, here's the other thing. Remember about this, uh, the James. Uh, remember his Suicide Squad film. It started with a whole bunch of characters that were announced, and then within the first ten minutes, they were dead. Do not expect. James Gunn not to do that again with Superman Legacy. He has announced a lot of characters in that film. I am not expecting all of them to be still in the film 20 minutes in. Now, this is me pure pure speculation. I'm just guessing. But when, when you uh, uh, announce a whole bunch of characters, I don't expect them to be big characters throughout the film. Maybe they'll they'll turn up for just two minutes for a joke. I don't know. We'll see. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for the um, uh, what's it? Uh, the, uh, the Justice Gang thing, which I'd heard being rumoured from DC. Yeah. Maybe if, if we could have a Rather than if it's if it's James Gunn, I don't expect him to be doing the Justice League in Superman. Not with if he wanted to make a big separation between what he's doing and say what Zack Snyder did. I don't think he'll do Justice League. He might do Justice Gang. We'll have to see. And but that will be a much smaller street level kind of affair, I expect. But uh, yeah, but these things they they do feedback. I mean, not quite as much to do with with Marvel, I think. But there's definitely a feedback between 
the DC films and the DC comic books. So they'll definitely want to reflect that to some degree more than just variant covers, which they usually go to. Especially it's because we weird know to that there was no Aquaman book out when the Aqu- when the last Aquaman movie came out. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So there's not quite the lineup that there might be. I mean, at Marvel, they had they had Madam Web all over the place. Do you know what I mean? And and you know, no one saw that. But if you were reading Spider Man, there was Marvel, Madam Web everywhere. So um, yeah, that kind of thing. Well, we know that well, Jim Lee and James Gunn have some kind of a relationship that is allow or and correct me if I'm wrong, but is allowing more of a free flow of conversation between them than might have existed before. Well, I don't know if that's true. I mean, Jim Lee and Zack Snyder were like that. I mean, okay. Jim Lee drew. Um, have, you, have you seen the, um, the 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 huge big um, thing that went up in? I think it was in LA, which was basically Jim Lee's art for what, what would have been the first and the second Justice League films from Zack Snyder. You can see all his plans because oh, Jim Lee yeah. drew them. All for, he was huh. he's been with Zack. It, but it, Bleeding Cool did run an article on this. We still have all the artwork up there. The, everywhere else uh, was told to take it down. We managed to keep it up. So if you ever want to read what. Um, Zack Snyder and Jim Lee's plans were for Justice League 2, it's there. So well, um, Gotta go see that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not me Googling. Yeah. There was, um, I, I, had, I would have to transcribe all the, the little tiny little details of notes that Jim had written or Zack had written or whatever. And that handwriting was, that was, that was, that was a fun, fun weekend, reading very small, very tiny handwriting. So yeah. That was a good one. But you know, so there are, so there have always been links, that, but it's just DC even hasn't had a Strong link between the publishing line as much, and the and the main line. You've you've always had like kind of spin off books. So DC have, have had like, we'll do this comic book that's in line with Smallville, rather than reflecting what's happening in Smallville in the actual comics themselves. So there's that's been their approach in the past. Maybe that's changing now. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Aaron Ruiz asks, I'm curious, what are the thoughts of the creators in DC? Are they excited or a little apprehensive about it? As much of as much as you could possibly know. Oh well, the, the thoughts of creators are usually kind of like, um, "Where's my check coming?" Um, yeah. That's I mean, it's. This is one of the things that I mean. Certainly, there's always going to be excitement, always going to be interest. People do this comics out of the love for it, but to some degree, it's also this is a job. And when you're working in these kind of comics, you've turned what was your hobby almost into your into your job, and that can sometimes harm it a bit. So basically, you may not be quite as excited about it because. You have got lots of other concerns about the work you're doing has to pay for your family, your house and things. So there are different concerns can come in. It is different to create own work. There's a different, there's always going to be a different vibe to it. Um, but there's definitely going to be an, always going to be an excitement about the work that you're doing when it impacts on a major cultural character like Batman or Superman and how that will be perceived by the world. Because when you do a, something big like this, it will have an impact. Maybe not now. Maybe, but maybe 10 or 20 years down the line, it will be reflected in a movie. I mean, actually, that, that time is getting, I said, it's becoming shorter. A lot shorter. I mean, when like Bendis was Day Naomi, and that, that got to the screen a lot quicker than people were expecting. Um, so those kind of things, the, the, the timeline is, is, is shrinking a bit. But even so, I mean, there are people who are working like um, in like, the noughties or the early 10s who are now seeing their work being translated into these kind of big films, and they, they'd forgotten about it. So it kind of turns up and they've, they're told, oh, your name's in the credits of this film. They go, well, why? Well, back in the day, you created this character and they turn up for three seconds. And so your name's <laughs> there. And I did, I do, I've talked to creators who have forgotten they've created characters who have turned out in films and were wondering why they were... They've seen the film, they saw the credit at the end, and they have no idea why. And they've literally forgotten they created a character who turned up. So that does happen. As long as the check clears, it's all good. To some, and, and that, I think that's fair enough. I think uh, I think that will be the case with all of us if, if in that kind of situation. Absolutely, um, a lot of it does come come down to we're doing. This is commercial uh, uh, creativity. We're, we're doing this work to get paid, and so that that is always going to be a factor. So I think you've kind of answered this already, but I I'll, I'll read it anyways. Um, will the absolute versions of the characters be more definitive and classical? Or elsewhere, El- elseworlds esque and non traditional. That comes from MP. Well, from what I understand, and again, things can change and things do. It's going to. I think. I think the idea is like, what if these characters were created now with modern sensibilities? So I don't know. I mean, this is. You could just guess things. Would you have um, a billionaire superhero now? 
maybe mm. you might be someone else. Maybe maybe there might be different origins there. Would you want to have mm. someone coming from another pla- coming from a planet? Yes, maybe. Would you want? I mean, there's a lot of the, uh, immigration fields with things like Superman and Wonder Woman. So there's maybe would that story be told differently now? Um, mm. Is Batman going to be? I mean, the, the the big Batman criticism has always been this is a billionaire beating up mentally disabled or uh, mental health challenged individuals on the streets of Gotham. Um, is this a is that is this always a good look? I that has been addressed in certain stories over the years, yeah. but maybe addressed by this one. I don't know. Um, but you can always look. You can look at those characters and think, well, what would they be if they were now? How would they be? How would they be different? Um, and in the past, I think some of the people have said, well, let's make them a different gender or a different uh, ethnic right. background and things. That might be that, that almost feels like it might be too an easy way rather than looking at the actual core of the character. So um, maybe the, mm. so I don't know. I, I would expect looking at those cores to change more than anything else. But yeah. what those cores are, what different creators identified them, um, that'll be up to them completely. This mm. be interesting. Hal, Hal Jordan fun. just flies drones now. That's what he does. Sorry? Hal Jordan is going to be flying drones uh, in this version. <laughs> Well, I mean, it is, I mean, it is the kind. This is the kind of thing, yeah, to some degree, yes. But um, if it okay, Green Lantern. If this is a character who has the greatest will on this on the planet, well, who on this planet now has the greatest will? Is mm-hmm. it Elon Musk? I don't know, but it, there are different people. Or is it, is it Malala? I mean, is it there are people who um, you can look at and say you've got such a great will to succeed and to push things through that beyond what should have been expected by someone of you, I expect. I mean, Greta. I mean, there were. Are yeah, these yeah. going to be Green Lanterns? I don't know. Um, but is it is it actually going to be a fighter jet, fighter pilot jet, where most of your decisions, or more of them, than say back in the day, are going to be computer controlled and stuff? Is 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 a Hal Jordan a more believable character when this is a character coming from the sixties yeah. than a character coming from the twenties? I don't know. But these are the questions I guess that are being asked and have been asked for a while. And absolute power, I think, is the solution to these. And in the case of someone like Hal or even The Flash, DC has all these legacy characters, it doesn't even have to be necessarily the version that we expect. It could yeah. it doesn't have to be Hal. It could be oh. it could be Sojourner, you know, like it could be it, it could it could we could start with Wally, right? Like anything yeah. is possible. Yes, very much so. Um, I I think they're gonna want to have something that'll hook it to the original. There's gonna be something that'll be we're not gonna make everything completely different. Right. Because why would you buy something if it was completely different from what you wanted? But it's going to be something that will hook this new version. There'll be aspects of the past, obviously, but there is a reason why we're doing it differently now. Um, and it's very much the, I think it's very much the, what if we created this character now? That I think feels like that's what Absolute Comics is. I love that. Are uh, we, love that. are they married to Absolute Comics? Do you know uh, title wise? Yeah. Um, or- that's the name, Absolute Absolute Comics. Um, as far as I'm aware, that is. I mean, DC yeah. have got ownership of that. They've got the Absolute uh, yeah. line of books. This huge big head. The, the Scott Dumier created slipcase hardcovers um, line. Those are great. Um, I've got a, a several of those myself. Hmm. Several, um, a few more than several. Um, and they're also <laughs> we've got Absolute Power coming this summer with Mark. Yeah. I, 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 again, this is me guessing. Is that I think Absolute Power was named. Because Absolute Comics was coming, yeah. Oh. So I think they are. I think I don't think I don't think they named Absolute Comics after Absolute Power. I thought this this event we got for the summer, Mark Wade show running, writing almost all of it. We got Absolute Comics coming. Let's call this Absolute Power. It's about so I mean it's about characters losing their powers and Amanda Waller gaining them all. So right. we can call it power. But um, I think that my guess would be that name came after Absolute Comics already been. Uh, decided upon. Now, maybe it will change. Maybe I'll have a different version of it. Yeah. Maybe, absolute, maybe it will be Absolute Batman. Maybe Batman Absolute. Be something else. Batman A. Um, <laughs> Batman B. I don't know. But um, <laughs> that's where they're coming from at the moment. Okay. Um, Dirk Manning says, I'd legit love to see a non-rich Batman. I think most people uh, would be intrigued by that. Hello, I mean, Dirk. Just, Welcome. That was just on the top of my head. I mean, uh, uh, T- uh, Tinian, uh, T- Tinian did that recently uh, when he, his book, he basically took away the billions mm-hmm. from Batman. Right. So, mm-hmm. so that he was only a millionaire now. So Batman was <laughs> only a multi-millionaire. Poor with little his, rich. With his townhouse in Gotham and his base, a sm- much smaller basement bat cave. So he didn't have the billions, he just had the millions. And that was, and that was a big change for the character. He had to do things differently. But... Well, um, and as yeah. we've seen in real life, being a billionaire, it puts you too out of touch. <laughs> you know, 
there were some issues there. Yes, absolutely. But I don't go, that was off the top of the head. There could be so many other things. I mean, again, super, I mean, you know, uh, if you were doing Superman now, how would Superman be perceived now as a alien from another planet? And when, when that is revealed uh, in the original comics, it was fine. No one seemed to have a problem with it. Would yeah. that be an issue now? Mm. I don't know. It's, um, if it, did, did Superman come over the southern border? I don't know. But there were, there were, there were aspects and questions that could be asked. Certainly, um, America has current uh, issues with uh, immigration that they had. They had different ones in the nineteen thirties. Right. So, how does that inform what Superman is now? These are, these are kind of questions it might be fun. So, I want to I want to get a couple more listener questions before we move into another matter. Uh, Atomic Count asked. I don't have the exact question in front of me, but he essentially asks. If there is any, if this situation, this absolute DC situation, has anything to do with the timeline of DC, the lapsed rights to the early versions of Superman, Batman, etc. Yes, Interesting. this is the other thing I talked about. The article. Yes, um, DC has ten years left where they can be the only people who publish Superman. Eleven years left will be the only people who can publish Batman. Similar with Wonder Woman. So basically, I think there's very much a you, right now, DC and Warner's has complete right to do Batman stuff, so they're going to do stuff because this is the idea. You've only got ten years; you might as well do something big and exciting, um, and then we'll see. Because yes, in 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 ten years, ten years time, anyone can do a Batman comic based on those early Batman books, and with every year that comes, more aspects of the Batman uh, mythology will become available for public domain. So just as um, you've got the uh, uh, Winnie the Pooh stuff now, um, we're about to have um, Popeye. Popeye's coming next year. And so, yes, there will be, so, as a result, there'll be, everyone can do films. So basically, in 10 years' time, Marvel can put Superman in the Avengers. Yeah. And, and they will. I mean, uh, Eric Larson is doing stuff with Mickey Mouse and Savage Dragon. Um, it's very entertaining. But, um, and while, you know, right now, DC can put, also the same, DC can put Mickey Mouse into uh, the Justice League if they wanted to. Anyone can do that stuff now, and that will happen. Uh, I'm sure Eric Glass will, will be doing Superman comics in Savage Dragon the second he's able to. Um, but yeah, everyone can. Everyone can do films, TV shows, and they've been. And as long as they're based on those those early books, that's nothing you can do. Marvel, uh, their, their stuff came along a lot later, mostly. But even so, Captain America, that'll be there very soon. So wow. it's a case of like, and then yeah, anyone can do whatever they want. I mean. To some degree, people always have we've always been like parody versions, but this won't have to be parody anymore. Now you won't be able to call it Superman on the cover, because that's still under the Warner Brothers trademark, which isn't covered by public domain. But yeah, you can if anyone wants to start working on their Superman graphic novel in the idea that they'll be able to publish it in 10 years' time, based on those very first issues of action comics, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can. And Batman comes next. So you see Mark Miller. Miller. Yeah, that's what he says. Well, now, I don't know if this is Mark Miller's negotiation tactic in public. He does like to do this. If he's trying to get a Superman book at DC and they're umming and ahhing, he's gone on Twitter to say, you know, in 10 years, I can just publish this by myself. That's a ballsy move if he is actually negotiating. Or it's the move after DC have said, actually, no, we don't want you. He's then gone, well, I'm going to do it myself. I'll, 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 you know, so either way, one of those two things is going on, I think. Um, Mark is a very, very clever um, neg a negotiator and operator. He rarely does things accidentally for this kind of thing. Um, if ever you want to have a look at Mark Miller's wonderful history of, uh, not exactly pranks, but um, Mark, uh, he basically finds ways to get the media talking about his comic books completely without any real um, basis in reality. But he just kind of fakes these great stunts. That's it, marketing stunts he does. And it, we've done a history of those every now and then. And he, he, he actually says he'll always do a stunt and then he can guarantee that I'll then do an article about the stunt. So he gets two bites of the cherry kind of thing. So he, he gets a double double blow. Um, and I think this is this has to be part of something that Mark's planning. Now, whether he'll actually mm. do what he's suggesting or if it's just part of his negotiation, I don't know. But it'll be interesting to see when he comes. So Joshua Nagel, he said, uh, what's the chances of Hickman heading over for something like that in reference to Absolute DC? Also, get... Donny Cates on something too. Is he a free agent right now? Now you said in the article that Donny Cates was attached and yes. now is not. So my that, question, I mean, go ahead. 
That is exactly what I believe. That certainly gives you kind of the level of the kind of people that they're talking at. I don't know what what the deal was. What happened? I mean, um, also remember Donny had a massive um, um, head injury and has had um, brain damage, memory loss, all these kind of things, uh, which was absolutely horrific. So it was basically maybe maybe it didn't work out as a result. I, Donny hasn't been writing anything that I know for a while anyway. Right. Um, so I don't know. Um, but that's the kind of level. I mean, John Hickman, that would be a name. I haven't heard John Hickman name mentioned, but that's certainly the kind of level. I think Hickman is exclusive to Marvel and I haven't had any change of that. Um, if I, and he's got new projects coming out. He's got uh, um, Aliens versus Avengers uh, coming out this summer. So I don't think Jonathan Hickman, because I don't think his timeline would line up. He can't be writing DC stuff right now, which he would have to be. So not Hickman, but definitely that would be the level of the kind of name I would expect to be attached. Absolute comics. You basically somebody who is not Marvel exclusive, and is a big name. And you know, you, someone did say uh, Al Ewing. Al Ewing is no longer Marvel exclusive. So yes, I would expect someone like Al, if not Al, someone like Al. That would make a lot of sense. On the Donny Cates matter, I think that's interesting to help us gain a timeline of of the of the absolute DC. So, to your knowledge, was he attached before his accident? Oh, that's is that how far back we're going? I don't know. Okay. Maybe, maybe he, maybe he was. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, that actually, that's something I hadn't thought of. Um, yeah, that would in, indicate he'd been going on a lot longer, but I don't know. I can't, I can't actually tell you one way or the other on the other on that. Because he was attached to Ultimate, the Ultimate relaunch. Yeah, yeah. I believe before he, that he was initially going to be the lead creative on Marvel, on on the new Ultimate comics. Right. And that was before the accident, and I believe John Hickman basically stepped up and was offered this, and obviously. Hickman's doing it in his own way. He's not doing it in the way that Donnie would have. But there was a bit in Ultimate Invasion which really read like a Donnie Cates kind of thing. It's the plot where the Maker um, attacks the army from the future by gathering all the um, descendants or their, or their descendants from the present and killing them off. And yeah. that really felt like, that felt much more of a Donnie Cates kind of plot line than it did a Jonathan Hickman plot line. Um, it felt like, oh, that's abs- that feels, that's over the top. It's absolutely gross. It's such a, um, it was the grossness of it, I think, that made me think that feels like it was originally a Donny Cates sign. I don't know, but he did, he certainly got thanked in, in the making right. of the book. But uh, I believe it was, it was originally going to be Donny and Brian Hitch, and it would have led into a new Ultimate Comics with, I don't know, Donny doing one of the books, maybe Spider Man, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so that, this is me speculating here. But that was the original plan. Things change. As, as we say before, things do change. Uh, I mentioned 5G before, all sorts of things can happen. Um, I, I, I enjoy finding all this kind of soup, the stuff that comes beforehand, kind of a soup to see what what actually will be brought out from it. So I, I do enjoy that, but I'm always aware that this might not be what actually happens in the end, because mm. stuff always changes and always has done. Um, yeah, I'm thinking back now to was it what, what was was it Armageddon 2001? Mm. That the DC plot line where apparently uh, the comic buyers guide spoiled a plot line from it, the ending, and so they decided to change the entire plot. And make Monarch to be Hawk instead of Captain Atom or something like that. Um, so you know that, that that was happening. That was happening. You know, a very long time ago. So um, this this kind of stuff has always happened, and stuff changes before it actually lands on the page. And occasionally, some things change after they've landed on the page. And when they, when you go and find the book that's been collected, suddenly it's like, there's a few different changes. It's like what's going on here? That's not how it was. <laughs> but that happens too. So yeah, yeah. Digital is a Digital is a bug for that because you can change the digital copy as well. Um, you can go back and change the digital copy. And if you're reading something, if you bought something on a streaming platform that you own the rights to, for because you bought it, they can still change your copy. So you, there you are, just sitting, and suddenly it's like I don't know, Back to the Future style. Suddenly something changes in the copy as you're reading it. So yeah, these yeah. So yeah, it used to be the case. Once it hit the page, you can't go back and change it. Not true anymore. Now you can. And Donnie was definitely stirring stuff on Twitter when he retweeted the uh, Bleeding Cool article about Absolute Comics. So, <laughs> Well, you, you, you also remember, uh, Donnie is a former Bleeding Cool writer. He used to report from uh, conventions um, in Chicago for Bleeding Cool. And he was, in fact, he still owes me a, a few articles. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't bothered him about that for a while now. But... Well, this is your platform. Get <laughs> after it, Donnie. Got it, Donnie. Donnie, forgive me. It's absolutely fine. It's all good. So... We're going to we're going to transition away from absolute DC. Um this is something that we are all excited about. I mean, Rich got me very excited <laughs> for where that's all going. Um and so we're going to monitor that and of course we're going to report 
uh, and 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 talk about the things that Rich uncovers as as this all moves forward. Cool. Uh, now, Rich, I would love to talk a little bit more with you about you and about a few subjects. Go for it. <laughs> about your history because you've been working in this industry for over thirty years. Yeah. I mean, you founded Bleeding Cool in two thousand nine. What? Was it like getting into this space in the 90s with the advent of the internet and how it created so much connectivity and the possibility for creators and fans and journalists or reporters to communicate and intersect? I read, I, I have spent, like for someone who wasn't around for all that, I've spent an inordinate amount of time on those old forums and boards oh, wow. researching for Twilight of the Superheroes and all that yeah. kind of stuff. I've read a lot of the stuff that you were doing at that time. Oh my goodness. So Did you what read about how I was originally going to be publishing Twilight of the Superheroes? I have a whole <laughs> segment about that. Okay, I am dying to talk to you about that. That was fun. That was a fun couple of weeks. But I got, I, the, first, I, I got the first season to this letter from uh, DC sent by email. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that stuff is so fascinating to me. So what was your experience like being a part of that early age of the internet okay. and and its and comics? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I grew up um, in Britain, uh, in a small little provincial town in the north of England called Pontefract, and there was nothing there. We didn't have a comic shop. It, uh, there was a one news agent that might occasionally get American comics, but that was it, and, and it was very sporadic. So my connection was quite small. Um, and then I went to university to a northern town, in a northern city called Newcastle, um, and they had this thing at the library on their computers called the internet in 1992. And that was fascinating. Um, and I discovered on this internet thing, there were, this is before the web, there was no websites. Um, I, the, the, there were just forums. Um, the Usenet news groups that I, that I found while um, trying to get some, um, I was studying politics as a degree and I was trying to get some files from, a, from another university in America. And the fact that I could do FTP, this is amazing way to transfer files from one university to another university. And while I was there, I discovered this thing called the Usenet News Groups, where were people just discussing anything and everything. Me being a big comic book reader and a fan, I, I decided to see if there's any comic book stuff, and there is. And that was Recarts Comics, or Recarts Comics Misc, and it's various spin-offs. Um, and that's where I met a whole bunch of people, like Paula Bryan and Peter David and Stephen Moffat, and all sorts of people just uh, who were just writing things. Stephen Moffat, wow. And this is great. Um, and then, here was, here's me. I, In my heart, I, I only realised this a little bit after this point, I was always a gossip columnist. I read the gossip column articles in the newspapers. <laughs> so there's a sort of high bar level to it. There's a British magazine still running called uh, Private Eye, which is a big political media uh, gossip magazine. And I, it is my, if anything, is my inspiration. It is Private Eye. And I saw these people talking about... Uh. Um, stuff that was going on. And I and then I realized there was a magazine in Britain, print magazine, called Comics International, run by Des Skin, who published Warrior, who who were the first people who published Marvel Man and V Vendetta, things like that. And his thing in the 90s, or in the 80s and 90s, was Comics International. And they ran stories that Americans hadn't read. And so initially what I did, I used to just basically copy out stories from Comics International magazine that hadn't been seen by Americans and post them. On the on these uh, Usenet news groups, not quite as if they were mine. I think I said uh, this is what they this is what has been said in a magazine, and some of them were, were true, some of them were false, some of them were just wrong, um, some of them were very right. But it was from being written from a, like a British perspective, where it was all part of the fun of it all. It was very much kind of like a fanzine kind of aspect, and it was Des Skin who had great contacts and Phil Hall, his editor, and I was basically kind of regurgitating some of their stuff. That's how I started. I'm I'm like eighteen, nineteen at the time. As a result of that, people started to send me stuff that they that they actually knew, and so I started to collate these as little kind of these little posts. The, originally, I think it was Rich's uh, Rich's revelations or Rich's rumblings. That was it, um, and it was just just gossip. It was comic book gossip. Some from Comics National, some from emails that had been sent to me by creators or fans. Things they'd come across. Some that are, some things that I'd started to work out myself as I was starting to get into this. Again, it was all it was all definitely influenced by British. Um, media ways of reporting stories and Americans really seem to enjoy this um, they hadn't seen anyone writing in the, in comics, about comics in this style before at which point 
Comics National said, uh, you need to stop doing that, what you're doing. However, you are running lots of stories that we have no clue about. How about we pay you for the rights to republish some of your stuff in Comics International? And that happened, I think, in 1994, when I started getting paid by Comics International for the stories that were no longer being sourced from, uh, from them, but from, but from all my contacts that had started to grow. And there were a few other people who were starting a little bit around that time as well, a little bit afterwards. Um, so you had news, Newsarama started on the Usenet news groups. Um, Hyde McDonald was writing stuff then as well. Yeah. Um, so you had some of those early days, like Greg McMillan, people were starting to write. Uh, Paul O'Brien, who's still doing the uh, X-Axis reviews now and still my favourite reviewers. Um, and so you had a bunch of people, uh, John and Trevor Carlson, and people like Elaine Wester Chapu, people who were writing, and who are still writing stuff now. But there's like a kind of a group of us and then people started to invent these things called websites. And there was advertising websites. And so suddenly there was a way to free people to actually make money. And I still didn't for a very long time. I, I, I stayed away from that concept for, for a good long while until eventually, I think it was, I need to get the timing of this right. I'd been, um, okay, I'd, I'd, I'd been doing these things for various websites. And then it was uh, David Bogart. He's now one of the main guys at Marvel mm. who uh, who approached me about maybe doing this for a website called Next Planet Over and getting paid. And my editor was this guy who was working with Rob Liefeld called Eric Stevenson. And so I, I was ended up, you know, I was, I was hired by David Bogart, um, edited by Eric Stevenson to write a gossip column about comics for Next Planet Over. And that lasted mm. four weeks until I believe it was Mark Wade and Kurt Busiek um, organized a kind of a creative strike that they wouldn't work with the website if they, if I was still going to be employed by them. But that was four weeks that I got paid, and I quite liked that. So after that, I started to look for more possible paid oh. opportunities. Uh, I, I, just, I did a thing called All the Rage for Silver Bullet Comics. Um, they all, they didn't actually pay me, but they promised they would. They didn't in the end. But oh, at no. least there was the promise of it. And then uh, Jenna Wyland at Comic Book Resources, which had emerged in this period, he says, come and do it for me, and I'll pay you an actual... Uh, some actual money uh, not a great amount but it was certainly a good amount in the day um, and that was lying in the gutters and that ran for a good long while and I think that's where I most became known by people in the noughties um, from lying in the gutters that became a kind of a brand name in and of itself and then and all this time I was working as an advertising copywriter that was my uh, day job that was, that, was my, that was my career that was everything I was planning to do i after university, I'd moved into radio advertising and then advertising in general, and then back into radio advertising. And I was a senior copywriter for a company called Radioville, and everything was great. And then 2009 was hit by the advertising recession, and every single advertising agency in London seemed to fire their copywriters overnight, and no one was hiring anyone. And I just had um, my second uh, daughter at the well, second daughter at the time, and was looking at. Uh, very bad things coming. So that's when William Christensen of Avatar Press said to me, that thing that you write for Jonah, the CBR, how about you do it for me every day instead of every week and I'll pay your mortgage. And that was the best offer I've ever made in my life. <laughs> I was looking at my house. I don't know what we were thinking, what we have to do, but that was, that was came. And that was, and I will, so I, I will owe William Christensen and Avatar Press that was Bleeding Cool. He, he let me, we named the site, came through a bunch of titles, um, but Bleeding Cool was the one that was approved because uh, they, they could get the website address for it as well. That was handy. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was, it was, and yeah, that's it. So Bleeding Cool started doing about three or four articles a day for Bleeding Cool back then. That was a part time job. I managed to get some uh, part time work in advertising as well. So I, I did that for a couple of years until William said, Yeah, now it's getting too big. You have to go full time. And I did. And Brought in lots of other writers over the years and things, but I'm I, I'm still there, and I just kept basically kind of doing what I was doing for lying in the gutters, but doing it ten to twelve times a day now, rather than once every week. So it's a quite a, it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's just it's a job. It's an actual proper job. It's a job that didn't exist when I was I was a kid wondering what I do when I grew up. Wow, you know. Um. So and I've the other thing is because of this, I've been doing it so long, um, and you can trace it back to ninety two. I am now officially the longest running digital reporter in the world. Because no, not just in comics, in anything, no one 
who either anyone who started before me has since stopped, or there was a big gap in between or whatever. But I'm the only one who's been doing it for this long, so it's quite a wow. it's quite a fun little claim to have. Um, I mean, Howie Knowles, I don't know if you remember Howie Knowles from Eighty Cool News. He started after me again on these Usenet news groups. Um, so uh, he's probably my, my 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 biggest challenge of that for that claim. So it's uh, yeah, I've just kind of kept it going more out of just. I mean, not really out of, out of inspiration, partially necessity. It's partially uh, just stubborn headedness. I like this stuff. <laughs> I'd never find a reason to stop. And if Bleeding Call collapses, and which I mean, to be honest, I've always thought Bleeding Call was going to collapse. I've always thought it's about a year, year and a half left in it. But I've thought that now for 15 years. And this is the 15th anniversary of Bleeding Call um, this year. So it's um, maybe, maybe there's a couple of years left in it there. Maybe I can, I can now extend my optimism for a couple of years. We'll see. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's it's great. I I've been able, to, especially for my second daughter, I was able to stay at home and bring her up rather than going to an office to work. Yeah. Uh, I was working from home before it was cool, kids, um, and that so that's something that I will always um, I would not have had otherwise. So it's something I feel very grateful about. Um, to Avatar Press, to William Christensen, to to Mark Seifert there as well, um, who basically enabled me to have a life that I could never have dreamed of having, and I think it's wonderful. And 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 they keep it going, and you know it, it keeps. Well, it certainly keeps well. It does well enough to keep going. Avatar Press are publishing a lot less than they used to, so Bleeding Call has basically become what Avatar Press does, which is known for, which is also great. So it's um, it's an absolute privilege and honour to keep, keep to be able to keep doing this. And um, I've no idea when it will stop, if it will stop, but um, for, to get 15 years so far out of a 30 year plus career doing this, oh, it's amazing. I'm so happy. It is amazing. And uh, I personally, I want to say thank you for all that you have done, because I think that the comics industry needs that. You know, um, I've always seen the, you know, the the criticisms and the takes on being oh, yeah. cool. But for me, since I, I don't know what anybody else's experience is, but I I see it for what it is. It's a it's a website where there's a lot of facts that you're going to get out of this and a lot of deep research and deep reporting. And when you're doing that, some th things change like you said sometimes yeah. someone might tell you something that ultimately isn't true but that's yeah. not you know what can you do about that you know well what reporting. you do is what i do is you research it. i don't, I don't right. tell something unless i've got i have to do some research always to find out if there's a likelihood of this if it's multiple sources that always helps or if it's one person who's just so well informed that their, that their position means that, oh yeah absolutely then that's going to be a thing so it's, i don't i'm never just i run about five percent of the stories i get um, but right. they have to go through quite a big. I, you know, I, I, it's, it's just the way it has to be because otherwise, you, you do look foolish. But hopefully, right. when people look back on the catalogue and stuff, they'll they'll be impressed with the stuff over the years that's come through. I, I see bleeding Call, certainly the comic book side as a pressure valve. It's necessary for the industry. It's somewhere where a bit of steam could be released. Um, it's also a canary in the mine. If there are problems coming down the road, bleeding Call can get ahead of them and point out there's an issue coming that might mm. that people might want to address first. And we've definitely done that a few times as well. Um, uh, also, uh, it's the idea of elevating uh, comic books or that might not have been seen otherwise. We do. I do a lot of work in pushing up works from smaller comic, comic book publishers that might not otherwise be seen. And sometimes, I know I do this, I will use a story like Absolute Comics at DC and I'll be running it at the same time when I'm publishing a, uh, a Kickstarter story about a creator who's pushing their own work and trying to get noticed. And it's really helpful for them to have a website like Bleeding Cool that's getting lots of attention for, for like like yesterday, like running the DC uh, solicits for, for July about 18 hours before anybody else did and got massive traffic as a result. But it also pushed um, attention for a number of other books that would have been, might have been otherwise ignored. And so mm -hmm. they've now got more readers as a result. So I definitely try and play the huge, big mainstream stories that I can, that I can get using my various contacts as a way to help draw attention to other books which otherwise might be missed. Now, I want to talk about, we teased it a little bit. I want to talk about Twilight of the Superheroes with oh, you real that was quick. Fun. Yes. And your involvement. So you, you talked about how Twist and Shout Comics, you nearly published the proposal we for did. Alan Moore's Twilight of the Superheroes. Yep. And I want to say, but for anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about, because obviously <laughs> this is like something that not everybody knows, essentially Alan Moore was going to do an event for DC Comics yes. titled Twilight of the Superheroes Things Change. Yeah. But he wrote a, a a proposal for it, uh, which was later titled "The Interminable Ramble," and it essentially breaks down exactly what he would have done. Now, yeah. on this channel, 
uh, we used a lot of the information that I was able to uncover from decades worth of mm. stuff that came out, which included your portion in that and the role that you played in it nearly coming out from Twist and Shout. So you said it was 95. That was a very early time for you in your career. Yeah. What was it like to be at the center of something that was so huge between Moore and DC Comics? Well, the the, the, the proposal, which had been a fair few years before that, so it was a proposal that emerged in the 80s. So it's right. about the time of like, about the time of Watchmen, this kind of thing, before, before things soured with Alan and DC. Over the, I think at the time it was the uh, ratings issue, having ratings issues on the, on the covers. That's what Alan walked initially from DC for, not over rights and things. It was about quite a few at the time, quite a few uh, DC creators, big names like Frank Miller and others. They basically walked because of they didn't want their having like 15 or 18 labels on the comic books, which was at the time being proposed. Um, so, but Alan had written um, Twilight of the Superheroes. He, he, it's interesting to look at his DC book. People forget this. A lot of his stuff was really heavily into the, the continuity of the time. When you read things like Swamp Thing, it's always tying in with things like Crisis or things or Justice League. While it was like a different world away, there were aspects that were being integrated into those worlds. So uh, Alan was aware of all the stuff that was going on in everyone's books. So he could reflect them in the Swamp Thing, which was a, which was not something I think that people look back and expect that when you reread it, um, because Alan was very much a team player with those kind of those kind of titles, and that's what he was wanting to do with with um, Twilight. He wanted to give DC a big money making event comic book that would spin off in, across the line that you would get um, spin offs like games, role playing games, trading cards, all this kind of stuff. He was writing merchandise. He was writing playing all the different merchandise. That you would be able to do if you wanted, and my f my favorite aspect of the of the proposal was that if a book ties in with Twilight the Superheroes, that's great. We could look at it, the future of that book, maybe tease upcoming plot lines for the titles. But if they don't choose to participate with the event, well, that also works as well because for some reason they are not part of Twilight the Superheroes, so you, so readers could infer other things. And I love right. that again. The idea that if you want to cross over with me, that's great. That's part of the story. If you don't want to cross over with me. That's great. That's also part of the story. Um, I, again, this, this is the kind of clever stuff. And this was an Alan, a very positive Alan, who's very much up for writing something that would be something big for DC and that all the other creators could, could do in a future set. This is the future of the DC universe where it's become this semi-apocalyptic, Not that, that basically power has changed, the superheroes are in charge, there are warring factions, and the world is different as we as we know it. And John Constantine being a major player in as well with the, in getting involved with the DC universe more than he maybe he had been. And it was great; it was wonderful. And then it didn't happen because Alan, in the time between that proposal and when it would have actually happened, Alan fell out with DC over all sorts of things, and it never happened. But the proposal still existed as a document and rumoured to exist, and then it got leaked from the internet. Someone typed the whole damn thing in. And they posted it on, on the on the Usenet news groups we were talking about before. And that's why I read it. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And it kind of was. And since I mean, since then, it, was, it got used in other things. I mean, you look at things like Mark Wade's Kingdom Come and Alex Ross's Kingdom Come. That would not have been created without Twelve of the Superheroes existing. Really? But, you So you believe you, that? You look at it. You look at it. And you, you look at the two of them. And you go, there is definite inspiration in Kingdom and in, 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 yeah, with from Twilight of the Superheroes for Kingdom Come, uh, 100%. And there's a whole bunch of other future stuff that you can see, oh, you do it that way because of you read this copy. So I got the idea, well, I should basically just publish just the proposal because uh, at the time I was self-publishing comic books um, as, as Twist and Shark comic books. There's a, a comic called Dirt Bag, which was published, and then a thing called The X-Flies that came afterwards. And that was quite fun. But it was the idea that, hey, we could actually publish this. And then, but, you know, how would I go about that? You know, what are the rights issues and things? I looked into it. I thought, well, you know, trade, DC, DC don't own the story. They just own all the trademarks. So I'd have to not put Superman on the cover. I couldn't advertise it as being anything to do with DC. If it was to publish it, I couldn't say Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, anything like that. You could read it inside, but you couldn't have it. You couldn't trade under that mark. You couldn't use the trademarks. So it could be done. And we looked at ways it could be done. And then Alan Moore came to town. He did a uh, live performance um, art piece of a uh, I can't remember which one it was now. I'll look about my records. But he, at the time, he was doing uh, he was doing spoken word performance artwork around England, in different places, 
Um, and I went to see one of them, and it was in Newcastle, and it was superb. It was amazing. It's still aspects of it still sit with me today. And then we went to the pub afterwards, and Alan was there. And so I got chatting to Alan Moore, which was, which was pretty good. Um, <laughs> I think the timing could have been after university, but I was still in Newcastle working as a radio station there. Also, at that, that by the way, that working the radio station that changed me as a person in a really good ways because I was casting, I was, I was writing radio adverts and directing radio adverts and casting radio adverts with the my favorite actors and comedians, anyone who I liked and I had a budget for, I could hire and work with. So that meant I got, I mean, these names that might not mean as much to you, but someone like Rick Mayall for me was my absolute comedy idol. And I got to cast him in an advert and direct him and work with him. And that was one of the most amazing moments of my life at that time. But it also helped that I kind of got over the celebrity thing quite quick because you had to work with these great people, these legend, legends in their in their careers, and I had to work with them and tell them what to do and not and get over myself quite quickly, which really helped with them. I was going to comics and stuff. I, I was able to bring that sensibility. So when Alan Moore was in the pub and two years earlier, I'd have been a gibbering wreck. At that point, I was fine. So I could just sit down with Alan, have a little chat with him, um, bring up Twilight of the Superheroes and say, would it be okay if I published it? And him say, yeah, that's fine. Here's my phone number. Call me if you want any details and things. Make sure it's all correct. And things. yeah, that sounds good. We'll work out a deal. That sounds fun. And that's where I announced it. That's going to happen on the Usenet news groups that we're going to do this. And that's when uh, I get the DC's first email, cease and desist letter from Bob Wayne at DC Marketing. At which point I have to call up and say, yeah, we actually do own this. We've paid Alan for this. Mm. So, oh, so I call Alan up and say, they say they you've paid they've paid you for it. And he goes, oh yes, well they did do that, I suppose, didn't they? <laughs> oh yes, they, they did act, actually they did pay me. They have a point. There's a fair point, and I can go, oh yeah, okay. Uh, okay. So, so we didn't publish it. Um, I did, however, on the cease and desist email because I wanted to get something out of it. But yeah, that was a fun little moment. But it did mean I got to read it. I got to talk to Alan about it and what he meant, and he liked the idea of you know it coming out in some form. But not through DC, obviously. Um, and now it is either it is or it has come out being published in the one of the big books. It did the DC through the eighties. That's the book. one. Yes, yeah. And I still think it's great, and it's. I, I still look at some of the plot lines and that. And I think that was a really good little twist. The uh, his stuff he does with with time travel. Um, the whole ending, the the, the twist, of the ending is yes. wonderful, and is the absolute epit- That's the most perfect John Constantine moment for me. I think it's screwing over your future self, because they are such a dick, is so him. It's Even though it's you, you do, and I, I've seen that done. I mean, there are certain things you see in things like Rick and Morty. It is very much, they read Twilight and the Superheroes. There's certain aspects where you, um, the idea of, of being the worst person possible to yourself because you're terrible is such a great little twist, and it has been used a bit since. But that was the first time I'd seen it, and it's still it's still hilarious. I think for me, that's one of the biggest shames of everything that went down with Alan Moore and DC. Of course, the fact that Alan feels so hurt by the industry that he hasn't worked with DC or Marvel or yeah. anything like or, that. Or now for a while, yeah. Right. But but also, I think we as fans lost out. And yes. I, I really think DC lost out on a lot because I, yes. I personally believe if this had been published, it would have been a major hit. And then Alan may not have left and there could have been more that he could have done. There are certain aspects. If, okay, put it this way. Um, we had the writer's strike. in the America, the, the, we, We've through a couple of writer's strikes in the States over TV rights and film rights and things where the writers struck because they wanted a better deal because the industry had changed. Initially when DVDs came along and then when streaming came along, the old mm-hmm. contracts never accounted for those. And that is basically what Alan Moore did with DC. It was when he wrote things like Watchmen, and V Vendetta, the trade paperback market didn't exist. Comics were published and then they were no, no longer published and he could get the rights back and do what he wanted with them. That was the, that was the plan with Watchmen and V, um, which V had already previously been published before DC as well, as worth pointing out. And DC said, no, we don't want to, we do want, we don't want to renegotiate. We have, we're quite happy with the contract we've got. Alan goes, fine. And Alan had a one man writer strike that he kind of kept ever since. DC did not, do not want to lose face, they do not go back, they do not change, even though they know, even with everything they've owned of Watchmen, the, the comic book, the TV series, the movie, everything like that, that's nothing compared to say, I don't know, 
hundred books that Alan would, would could have written for DC in that time. Nothing compared to what they might have got out of it. Um, but when Neil Gaiman had the same issue with Sandman and wanted to renegotiate, DC kind of went, yeah, okay, maybe this time, maybe we won't be quite so pig-headed as we were last time. And so as a result, Neil Gaiman kept writing Sandman past issue 9, past issue 10, and DC has Sandman and has got so much more out of it. And Neil will still sometimes work for them and do stuff and lots of other, and it birthed Vertigo and all sorts of things. So DC, DC learned from their dealings with Alan Moore. They, they, didn't, they weren't going to change any of the dealings with Alan Moore, but they learned from them and tried to do things a bit differently in the years since. And then at some point in the, in the, in the teens, they kind of went back again when Alan Horn at Vertigo changed everything and said, oh, we, we don't want to be giving these rights away to creators. And that's when that ended up killing off Vertigo. But that's another story. Um, oh. But yes, so that, that's kind of where a lot of people look at, talk about Alan being some kind of like grumpy hermit, fun wrecker, which is absolutely not true at all. Um, he's a very generous, he's a very funny man. But what, um, what he does do... Um, He's, he's got very strong principles. And if he believes that you've acted against them, he he can't, he can, well, that's it, we, we don't need to do business anymore. And that's in his personal relationships, also in his business relationships as well. So, and sometimes that's unfair, I think. Um, but sometimes I see it absolutely, that's, it's a very principled stance that he takes. And I have to, and I absolutely respect that. And we've got more stuff. I mean, we still got stuff. Um, this year, end of this year, we've got um, the Moon and Serpent uh, bumper book by Alan uh, which is a big kind of comic book annual, massive big volume written with Steve Moore, um, the late Steve Moore, also drawn with uh, Kevin O'Neill, the late Kevin O'Neill, and a bunch of other collaborators um, that, he's, that, he's, that he still works with. Um, and that's coming out later this year from Knockabout, maybe from IDW as well, I'm not sure. But that's, that, I'm so looking forward to that. That is Alan Moore's big, 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 thick comic book writing stuff. Um, that's going to be coming out later this year. And yeah, I, I've already got my copy ready. That's exciting. Yeah. And there's, and there's more stuff. I mean, there's, there's the other thing. If you like Alan Moore, you can keep finding new stuff that you didn't know existed because his career was so long. There's a book I push called um, Cinema Purgatorio by him and mm. Kevin O'Neill, which is a weird and wonderful hellish take on the history of American cinema, uh, which is very, very funny. Very, very twisted. I mean, you've never read the history of Warner Brothers before rather what's being told as if they're the Marx Brothers. And that is just superb. And I would, mm. uh, it's, so there's always stuff you can keep finding. I keep finding new bits that I didn't know. I'm a massive Alan Moore fan. But every every year I'll find something that he did. Uh, a BJ and the Bear annual from 1981 or something. That, no one was expecting that, but there it is, it's there. So you, there's there's so much stuff you can find. So maybe maybe we're okay we didn't get Twilight in the Super Heroes. There's a lot of other stuff we've gotten as well. Maybe, maybe yeah. if we had Twilight, we wouldn't have had From Hell. And From Hell is one of my favourite graphic novels of all time. So if, if that's the monkey's poor thing, I'll take it. So for me, I think the thing that you did, the thing that you reported on that I connected with the most is the 5G files. <laughs> yes. And I was so invested and and just just over the moon about it. You know, we covered that on this show week over week. I couldn't <laughs> believe the stuff that you were putting out. I couldn't believe that you knew these things, you had heard these things, and also that this was so meticulously planned and then never materialized at all. DC oh, themselves did, did a bit, little bits well, of it did. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes, absolutely. And I love that fact, right? Because what you're referring to is the fact that pieces of what Didio did and planned actually did make it into the books, just not yeah. as a 5G initiative, right? So I love that. And I think that's all brilliant. Are there things about 5G that you know that you never wrote about? A few, but only because the sources in question ask me not to. Not a lot, nothing, nothing major. There's a few details. When the, I, I have my two rules in all the reporting, um, I never use anything anyone tells me without their explicit permission, mm -hmm. and I never reveal a source. So um, there's a couple of things. No, no, nothing major. A few books I'm aware that it would have been planned would have existed by creative teams, 
the creator involved says, who I, or, or the person involved who told me the story says, I can't let that get out, otherwise they know it could be for me, that kind of thing, even now. And I always respect that. Every now and then, I will go back and just check with a few old stories, a few classics. I go back and say, hey, is this still the case? Just want to make sure. And they go, yes, Richard, it's still the case. You can't run it. That's fine. Just check. But um, so there <laughs> are a, 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 few, a few little a, a bits, but, but nothing major, but nothing huge. So. Do you believe that Dan Didio would still have been fired at DC if he had let 5G go? If he hadn't pushed so hard? I know there was a lot of behind the scenes turmoil, well, him and Scott Snyder. Do you uh, think he still would have been fired? Gone. Everyone, yeah, yes, there was. Um, basically, the, the big dichotomy was between Didio and Johns, and they both kind of ended up getting kicked out because of it. Um, now, hmm. Dan, I like Dan a lot, I really like him. I think he's one of my favorite people in comics. Um, he did have a reputation of getting a bit too involved in stuff to the degree that it just annoyed a lot of creators, as in like books got rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. Some books got redrawn and redrawn. I remember this one book where a new creator had been announced on it. Um, a, a significant creators. Um, and the first book was just dumped. It was like, it was like the first issue was, was written and drawn and binned. And then re- rewritten and redrawn and binned. And while the third time, the guy said, I just can't do this anymore. And he just left uh, halfway through rewriting for the third time. So and that was Dan. Dan had an idea of what he wanted. And if he wasn't getting it, he would get very much in the weeds to the degree that someone in a position as publisher, this is the kind of thing the editor or editor in chief should be doing, is not really would have been his role. And that, I think, is more than anything, eventually, is what led to his dismissal. He was seen, those are the issues that were brought up that I'm, I'm, I was made aware of. It was that kind of relationship with uh, with other staff of the creators as seen as too much. And that's why he was he was left. Now, some people like what he did, some people didn't. Uh, but um, no one can ever argue that he wasn't um, absolutely committed and absolutely emotionally involved and in working with the greatest um, uh, sense, sense of responsibility about everything he was doing. And I certainly enjoy a lot of what he did bring to DC for the new 452. There's amazing things in there, and they would not have happened without him. But initially, when he started, his nickname at DC was, was Shooter, after Jim Shooter, who was also known for being like that. And then a few months in, it was like Jemis. He's our Jemis and Bill Jemis. He was being compared to Bill Jemis, who really was, again, getting into the details more than one would have expected. And just as what happened to Chuta and just as what happened to Jemis eventually gets too much and they get booted. Mm. Because, and that's what kind of happened with, with, with Dan. Um, so if, if 5G had happened, all those issues would still have been there. All those issues would have come to the fore in just the same way, I think. So maybe he might have got a few extra months of grace because of the six, if 5Gs was a success. I don't know. Um, but, you know, I, I think he was a lot happier. He was doing some work with Frank Miller recently, and then he's moved on to do something else. He's putting out a novel. I mean, he's not he's not hurting. Dan isn't hurting. And he's got stuff that he's getting involved with. Um, so I don't think he... I, I, I think, so he's fine. Uh, I I think it was... I can see the uh, things... I'm, I'm convicted. I can see the arguments for and the arguments against when it came to Dan. Um and there were, I also know that he, he was also, I think, a canary in the coal mine as you were for everything that was coming for DC a year later when you saw decimation of staff. So there we go. Yeah. Um, I don't think that even if Dan had stayed as publisher then, I don't think he would have survived that decimation. Well, I say decimation, so it was whatever half is when they lost about so many uh, ed- senior members of editorial senior, staff. Senior, yes. Um, I don't think Dan would have. I think Dan was the early version of that. Do you think that those uh, those firings were a deliberate effort to shuffle the deck on the editorial side of things, or do you think it was just cost cutting? Um, it was definitely the initial in, in impulse was cost cutting because this is happening across the board. But then, what what decisions do you make? And I think there was definitely an idea of let's get rid of some of the old, some of the old stuff. People who are like more f- connected with people like you know Bob Harris went kind of stuff. Right. People connected with like the New Fifty Two, I guess. So you saw, but you also saw people like some of the editors who were there from came over from Wizards. So there's definitely they, they lost a lot of they lost decades and decades of experience in this firing, certainly centuries even if you add it all up. Um, but maybe there was an attempt to try. We want to try and be a bit more new, a bit more modern, get rid of some of the older ways. 
whether we'll actually do that or not, that's a different story. But I think that might be one of the impetus. These are the choices that we make. When we're going to get rid of. Also, the more senior person you get rid of, the more money you save. And yeah, Warner Brothers. If you if you've been there for like twenty years, you've had automatic pay rises every year. Your pay packet is really quite. Impressive. I mean, I looked at what they're offering for a new Batman group editor, and I mean, it's more that I get paid, but it's not more than people were getting paid a few years ago for that job. So basically, that job is is I don't know maybe a, a half of what you could have got paid for that job ten years ago, and that's interesting. Am I mistaken that you ran an article where you talked about how that job was be, the the pay was the same as the janitor at the building? No, it was it was the editors, not just the crew editor, but the edit and uh, editor editorial staff. Right. And I just compared that this is the range of pay, and in the same website, this is what you're paying for the cleaners. And it was a case of oh, because okay, so basically the, the the cleaner is was at the lower end of a full time editor at DC in the same building, and I thought. That's new. Hmm. So um, I so I definitely think editorial pay has come down, certainly at Warner's, certainly at DC. They've got rid of some of the, a lot of the legacy editors who are clearly on a lot more than that. Um, and so maybe maybe it's the, the new people they're bringing in are paid less. I don't know. They lost, they lost Ben Abernathy to Skybound. Uh, I, I expect, and, and he'll have been on, and Ben would have been on a decent wage at DC. He's been there for a while. Skybound will have had to beat that and more, I expect. So yes, yeah, Skybound are clearly paying very very <coughs> very very high payment for them to work as well maybe that's the industry norm in their side of the business they're dealing with amazon prime video that is dealing with uh mc all that kind of stuff for skybound so maybe they have different expectations there but um yeah it's it is it's it's weird this is again this is the industry all over when you're looking at um, page rates for writers and artists and when you look back and say oh you've got those are the same rates that some people were being paid in the 80s you know, well that's impossible no, that kind of is. Um, now, some people's uh, work rate has been sped up by new technology in some degrees, but not always. It is it's it is very strange to look at that. I mean, it's, you're not getting the, the hundreds of thousands for everything sales that you might have had, say, in the eighties, but you're st- but you're still getting decent sales on a lot of these books. It is yeah. it is strange. Okay, one I looked at Marvel. There was a the new um, spectacular Spider-Man series written by the guy uh, the name's God who did who created gargoyles um the cartoon and uh, greg, greg weissman greg yeah. weissman yeah yeah and he ha- he was hit by an attack he was hit by an email attack he got hacked his twitter got hacked his private messages emails got leaked there's a lot of nasty stuff that went along with that but one of them was also his, his marvel contract and so we all got to see exactly how much he was getting paid for writing the launch issue of spec of, of spectre of spider-man and i think it was something like it was a 30 page comic and he was getting paid. I think it was. Something, I, I think it was like hundred pay, hundred dollars per page for for plotting and scripting. He basically got three thousand dollars. I think that's right for a thirty-page book. I need to check, but something like that. And that is significantly lower than what you might be able to expect um, previously. And this was for a major industry name, right? Writing the launch issue of a major Marvel title. I've got the exact figures. You can look it up to see what what was right. But either way, I looked at. It, I thought. That's that's low. Even at the time of all that, that's low. And this is an accepted. Now maybe and I'm sure Greg's got an agent. I always felt like I need to find out Greg's agent to tell him he should at least negotiate a bit. Maybe <laughs> no. So I did an article. Maybe don't know you should actually get paid more than this. But I know people who paid for like a twenty page book for the New Fifty Two in twenty eleven. They were getting about four grand a book, and that was because not, not that was not a high amount. That was about the standard. You'd be getting about four grand a book if you're writing. One of the new fifty-two books in twenty eleven, and that's I mean, less pages. Yeah, yeah, and then maybe you're getting more for um, Batman or so. This is like one of the mid-range books or whatever. Nothing, but that felt me really like yeah. So you, how did you go from being paid four thousand to write a twenty-page book in twenty eleven to being paid three thousand to write a thirty-page book in and 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 this being a, a big launch title from Marvel with their two big to the big characters, Peter Parker, Spider Man, and Miles Morales. So. That's the stuff I look at. I think, hmm. I and I, this is what this is one of the things when you get new people, when new people come in, they don't always know where people were being paid before. So if you, when you get new stuff in, maybe you're paying them less than you're paying the old stuff for. Maybe over time that keeps happening. That's why you have churn in the industry because it's it's a way to actually keep costs down. Right. 
rather than keeping them up. Um, so there are these are issues. Uh, this is the kind of thing that Bleeding Call does try and take it, take a look at. And because we've been doing it for fifteen years, I guess there's also a bit of legacy knowledge. This, oh, even me for doing it for thirty years, the stuff that we've done in the past, we can now bring. We can offer a kind of perspective on because which which is great for everything. By the way, we try and one of the best things I could bring, I think, is a sense of perspective. So people say, oh, this thing is terrible. I can't believe this thing is, is happening. You say, well, this has been happening for 40 years, and you were fine with it when you were when you were 15. And this was happening in 19, 2011 or whatever. So you, you can look at, this thing has always happened, and you were fine with it then. Why do you have a problem with it now? That's always a good one. Um, because because we change. That's the original big... Right. That's the, that's, people always look at the comics industry changing. The comics industry change, has not changed half as much as we have as people since we were five. We have changed a lot since we were five. We've changed I hope. We were 10. We've changed a lot since we were 15. Much more than the comics industry has changed since then. But um, so having some kind of sense of perspective, I think, is really useful. Um, and hopefully, if I could bring anything, uh, aside from having contacts and things, that's what I can, I can try and do. Well, hopefully you can bring some perspective on this question that we got from Atomic Hound who said, what is Rich's perspective on the American comic book market overall, and does he see similarities to other soft periods? Who does he see as... What does he see as key steps to improve the market? Well, this is not a soft period for comics. This is a boom time for comics. Comics are selling more... American comics are selling more in America than they have since like the 30s or the 40s even. Right. Um, right. They just have to be different comics they're selling. Um, it's not it's not superheroes more, as much anymore. It's other stuff. Well, we, it's, it, we, really, it is super. The best selling comic book of all time, as, as an ongoing thing, is a superhero comic book published in America, written and drawn by Daft Pilkey, and it's called Dogman. And they print five million copies of that. And that's more than like Captain America or Superman was was printing back in the day. The only things that ever sold that much in America were things like the stunt issues of X Men One or X Force One. For one issue, Dogman sells that for 11, 12 books, and its spin off Cat Kids sells eight, three million. But it's not just that, there's a whole bunch of books like this. Investigators, that sells two to three million. The works of Raina Telgamir, her graphic novels for kids, again, these are all for kids, are selling three million. Um, Shannon Hale, who used to do, she used to write like Wonder Woman comics that would sell maybe 20, 30,000 if you were lucky. She's doing like the best friends graphic novel books, and they get print runs of three million. I mean, this is, this is where the, it's kids' graphic novels. This is almost why I like to call it as the new newsstand. Kids who are like five, six, seven-year-olds, millions of them are all reading comics. Now, the comics interest's job is to think about what's going to happen in 10 years' time. What can they give them to bring them into their own stuff? Because we, you're going to have a huge comic book literate market in America coming through. Now, either they're going to read manga, which is already there. They're going to read the superhero stuff, which is already there. Or maybe you're going to find something else to appeal to them. Mm. And that's where I think publishers need to be looking. They need to be looking at down the line. Do we, I don't know if you're going to get the dog, you know, the, the dark dog man returns, but there needs to be something to get. I mean, if you got 10% of the kids reading those comics when they were kids to keep reading them when they're adults, that's, that's half a million readers. Yeah. Mm. Right there, waiting. And that's only, it, it, you, you might be able to get more. Um, so, it's basically the, the ballpark. It's, it's there for the comics industry to step up. The readers are here. There's a huge, big boom time. It's just for Marvel and DC. It's in other books. DC have done a, actually done a fairly good job in their things like their Titans graphic novels. Those have been selling a lot. They've been getting big print runs for those in these high six figure print runs. Um, the Titans graphic novels will outsell like the Batman comic book, things like that. The staff, oh, no. the, the new Starfire one got a print run that just a print run for the first printing. That's more than what Batman sells every month. Um, so they're they've seen a way, and they're they're tapping into the older, not either, either YA market or like slightly older kids who, are, who like that kind of stuff. So they they are finding ways to tap in. Marvel have decided we can't even do it with this. We we don't we, we let's just let Scholastic do it. So Scholastics have been doing things like the Miles Morales graphic novels through Scholastic. Scholastic have also published things like Dogman, and they've got a great um, tie into like the the book fair. Um, book fair markets in across America, and they are selling. I mean, the the Scholastic Miles Morales book is the best selling Marvel comic book. But I'm not. It outsells X Men. It outsells um, 
Ultimate Spider-Man, everything. It just happens to be it, the sales aren't happening in the comic stores. They're happening in book fairs or in bookstores or through Amazon or, or through libraries um, mm. or whatever. So these, or whether this is where the market is booming right now. Absolutely. It's just that I like to write about the comic books. I like to write Marvel and DC. So that's what I like to write about. But I can't, and that's what I like to read. I'm not going to be as much of a market for those books as other people are. I mean, okay, Rain and Telgamere's work, I do, I do utterly enjoy. So I, that's not sure about that. But um, so I may not be the target market for comics. That doesn't mean the comics market industry is dying or, or falling apart or crashing. It just means that the bits that I'm the target market for might be because there's less of me now and people like me are dying off we're getting older um so all through here's okay here's my my big thesis is all through uh comics is the comics industry and its history is that the market has changed to reflect the whims and vagaries of the market of the day so it began with things like crime it moved to things like superheroes and they were successful and then moved away from superheroes and we moved to romance comics when uh Simon and Simon and Kirby created romance comics after they did superheroes because superheroes weren't selling as much. So and then people moved to westerns and then TV spin-offs and cartoons and all these kind of things. And, and then superheroes had a bit of a revival in the sixties, but there was still everything else happening as well. And as you look at what Marvel were publishing in the mid sixties, and you see all the familiar superhero books, and then you see Millie the Model, and you see uh, Night Nurse, and you see the western books, and the army books as well because they were publishing all those too. Then we had another slump in sales, and that's when the direct market happened. And the comic book store happened. Comic book store, they love their superheroes. And you basically put the entire comics industry in amber for decades. It stopped changing in the way that it always used to. It found its audience. It created a superhero-loving audience. And the direct market didn't have to respond to the newsstand, the mass market anymore. It was just the fans. The big name fans who love the superheroes and it caters to them and it creates wonderful works. But it just is superheroes because that's what we liked the most. And everybody else, people who had been buying stuff on the newsstand, the romance, the Western books, those books fell away, the audiences fell away. Now we're getting to a stage where direct market is being challenged by bookstores because bookstores can now sell graphic novels in a way that they never did before. And you're seeing things like Scholastic and the book fairs. And it's crazy. It's finding that untapped mass market for comics that comics used to have back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, it's still there. It, people love comics. They just have to know that they're there. They can read them and they exist. They can buy them. And so you're seeing a change. The direct market is getting smaller. It's getting starting to splinter with the distributors splitting up as well. Because now, as there's less money, there's more reason to fight over what's there. So mm. you see more of a splintering. So that aspect of comics is, is I still think it's fine. I, I still think it can keep itself going for, for, for decades to come. Um, even when they start to lose rights to certain properties. I, I, I don't see it dying or anything, not like that. Getting smaller, yes. Getting more niche, yes. Um, but comics as a whole is huge. And that's just printed comics. And that's just talk about the Scholastic and as well as manga, as well as the webtoon. The webtoon is the biggest publisher of comic books in the world, and they've got a massive audience in the in the US as well. Um, and there, so the, there's a lot to love. There's a lot to be positive about. It's just if your idea of what comics is is an insular, it has to be Batman, has to be Spider Man. Then yes, I can see how you might think everything's getting worse and everything's getting smaller. But if you actually love comics as the as the medium, the thing that does stuff that no other medium does, it. If the thing that engages your left hand side of your brain and the right hand side of the brain at the same time because you're reading and watching simultaneously. Nothing else does that. You get a graphic immediacy of film and television with the same kind of internal monologues and understanding of novels. And you get it in one medium. And I, I love comic books to my core. I think it's amazing. And I do love superhero comics as well. But I, I try to there's so many there's so much more out there. And I think it's an imperative for everyone if they can. To at least find out what else is out there because it's great and not just to find comics as what's in the comic store but um look wider that was a brilliant answer and i'm glad you gave it because it was, that a, bit is long. A, it was a bit long but that but that's a recurring subject on this podcast that, for yeah. years and so yeah. i'm so glad that you just illuminated and gave us you know well, your no thoughts on... me. no one interrupt me this is the thing if people don't interrupt me because i do interrupt people um i will just keep going <laughs> so yeah please do interrupt me if you if you if you, if you need to 
Well, I, I really just have one last question for you. Okay. Um, and this is another thing that I've been fascinated about for years, and I feel like only you can help me out with this. So, in my opinion, Marvel has a history, especially over the last 10 or so years, of denying things on the top end that would later on become true. <laughs> we would know to be true. So an example is when Marvel said that they were not keeping the X-Men back in the comics and keeping them in amber, as you said earlier, um, because of the Fox deal, Marvel said that was not the case. I'm pretty sure Tom Brevoort himself said that was not oh, true. No, he didn't say that. This okay. is what I love about Tom. Tom, I believe, said uh, at the time, um, can you imagine any business behaving like that? It would be crazy. <laughs> And at the, now at the time that this decision had been made from above, from, from Ike Perlmutter. Right. So this was the, so Tom didn't deny it. He just said he couldn't imagine any business behaving like that because it would be crazy. Um, even though he clearly knew that that's exactly how the business was behaving. And it was crazy. And it took a while until Jonathan Hickman, I believe, kind of like spilled the beans over at News Rama. Right. Um, yes. Yes. And it, but we have basically been covering it for a good long while and just pointing out it is happening and it's crazy. My favorite one was, I think, when they when they were taking characters off the T-shirts, I mean, like Secret Wars T-shirts, and they were just like, pick out the X-Men, so they went on there. All the... The video the, games. Uh, there was a calendar where they had the, the She-Hulk line about, buy this book, I'll come to your house and rip up all your copies of the X-Men. And then they changed that bit. They, changed, they took out X-Men, or just, I'll come and rip up all your comics. They just snipped it out of the of the calendar. Things like that. It was ridiculous. Um, huh. Statues that were abandoned halfway through. Games... That they suddenly couldn't use things halfway through. Um, it was absolute craziness. But you're right. Yeah, they they did they didn't deny it. They just didn't confirm. And they and Tom is an expert in his use of words. Yes, um, I agree. He he will he'll, he's not he's never going to lie, but he may send you in a certain direction that's not true. Okay. He's a big Doctor Who fan, and as we all know, Doctor Who the Doctor always lies. And Russell D. Davis and Stephen Moffat especially always lie. So um, I think he's definitely got a little bit of inspiration there. So yeah, yeah. But why do we actually have to tell all the truth at least? Well, so when when Miss Marvel was killed in Amazing Spider-Man, right? There was a lot of speculation that that was in an effort to align her closer to the MCU and make yes. her a mutant and all yes. of that. Okay, and that that came from up top. And that that is what Zeb Wells and co had to do. Now, this week, this week, Cody yeah. Ziegler confirmed yes. as much yes. from his own opinion. Right. But from what Marvel from what says that Zeb Wells told him. Right. Marvel has denied it. Their representatives yes. have flatly denied it. Yes. Do you believe them when they say that that decision yes. did not come from Kevin Feige? Yes, I do. Because I, I what I believe and this is what I've my long experience with them is it didn't need to come from Kevin. They they saw this was happening and they're doing their best to try and align stuff. So my reckoning is yes. that someone at Marvel, at all they said, look, this is happening. We need to align stuff. This is the way to do it. Because Kevin, and Kevin will like that. Kevin won't have a clue. But I'm, I expect that they will have been given the edict. If there's an edict, if there is an edict, it'll be make sure your stuff is at least in some way like, linked up to what we're doing. So, yeah. Um, to even if, if only to be relevant, which is why I was saying why there's so much Madden Web suddenly in Spider-Man comics, even though you know the film didn't do very well, Marvel had planned that it might have done a bit better than it did and have Madden Web everywhere. I mean, not enough to actually give her a comic book, they're not mad, but at least <laughs> you know, she's all over the place in the Spider-Verse books and things. Um, and you'll see the same with, with Craven coming, and there'll be Craven everywhere. I I do remember when, when the classic days when you had um, a big divide between this studios in the comic book side, the East and the West Coast. Um, you saw that happen quite readily in the actual... You can actually see the difference between the TV, which is the East Coast, and the movies on the West Coast. Because initially, they were very much aligned in the S.H.I.E.L.D. days. The Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., they were very much aligned. But I remember when after seeing Captain... I think it was Captain America, Winter Soldier, I think. And one of the characters, oh, one of the S.H.I.E.L.D. characters, was revealed to be Hydra, one of the... Ward. And I, yeah, and it was I, Ward. Uh, uh, no, what, what was that? It was Ward. No, it wasn't Ward. It was one of the uh, minor, one of the more minor characters in, not one of the main characters, but who'd been in the movies. 
but, 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 but it was revealed in the movie that he was uh oh was yeah 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 I and i and i and i told one of the main marketing guys who i knew loved this character oh, i can't believe you kept that so secret that he's hydra and he goes what are oh, you just spoiled that for me i had no idea i was like what you had no idea so basically the, the east coast had no idea that one of the characters they've been using and whatever in the movies was 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 in the TV series they didn't know he was Hydra and then and the big fight, and people <laughs> were going people who work on the Shield TV series were going to uh, the screenings of the film of, of, would sort of work out what they had to write because they weren't being told that was a massive oh. divide. Wow! So things changed. Obviously, the the um, Perlmutter being kicked out and all that kind of stuff. Things changed, and now they're all kind of like singing the same song sheet. So now. Marvel Comics is very much, I think, we never want this kind of situation to happen again. Let's just try to stay ahead of things. If we see things coming down the pipe, they might not get all the information, but they will try and stay ahead. So they would have known that Ms. Marvel was going to be a mutant ahead of time. What they did with it, that's up to them. Right. So with this kind of stuff, I think Marvel is basically just, you know, yeah, we need, to, we need to make these things. What's the way of doing it? This is a way of doing it. Now, if they somehow along that line, it's been Kevin Feige has been penned, paid as the bad guy, He's making you do this. It's quite ironic. And uh, I'll tell you why. And actually, this actual definition of irony, if you want it. Um, so if if creators are being told this is what Kevin Feige wants, even if he doesn't want it, it's just being used as a scapegoat for maybe that's what a creator is doing to another creator. Maybe that maybe Zeb Wells uh, used Kevin Feige as a scapegoat uh, to explain to to, to Cody. I don't know. Maybe that's what it was. The irony is that. There are some bad Ike Perlmutter stories out there. Um, like I think one I, I know was he got rid of a female villain for Iron Man three because um, female toys don't sell well enough, so they had to have a male villain instead. Um, mm. And I that was that was attributed by actors who were saying that's why it was changed, and they were told it was uh, it was all blaming on Ike Perlmutter. And I know for a fact that Ike had no interest or no care about that whatsoever. It was used by let's say people on the West Coast as a way to explain their creative decisions to actors where they didn't want to take responsibility for themselves. They'd use Ike Perlmutter as a bogeyman. Interesting. As a way to say, oh, no, we, we, we're doing this change. We know nothing to do with us. It's all about Ike. Um, and now if Kevin Feige has been used as a bogeyman by people say, oh, we, we, we can't, yeah, sorry about this change. We have to make this change. It's all down to Feige. Um, I think that's very funny. And it is oh. absolutely incredibly ironic. And um, I don't know. I, don't, I still want to pronounce Kevin Feige's name as if he his name rhymes with beige. I, 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 <laughs> beige. Sorry, but that's, I'm sure I said to his name, his face at one point. Oh, anyway, it was a long time ago. Um, yeah, it's it's funny. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's politics. There's a lot of politics going on. And when it comes to this kind of story, I believe entirely that Cody believes this. I believe this is exactly what happened to Cody. But whether it's actually true... Is a different story. Whether it was actually because it, it's we're, we're getting a game of telephone now. There's yeah. one creator, to one creator, from one editor to an to an executive editor. I don't know, but if it if it gets changed along those lines, then it, yeah, this is the story we're now going to get. So I looked into it, and from what I could find, this was a Marvel Comics editorial joint decision, collective responsibility, whatever, rather than something imposed by um, Feige or Ananat or anyone like that. As I said, that might change. Because the the actual quote that Ziegler says um, in this article is that Feige told Wells, "Hey, I don't do this very often." Well, I know I was it the Feige told Wells, or, or it came to Wells as having come from Feige. I'm not sure, um, but again, I think there's there are more levels of, of telephone that are being uh, yeah. alluded. To. Yeah, I just yeah for me for me what's funny there just based on what you're saying. Is that Feige saying, "Hey, I don't do this very often." It's like, well, yeah, he doesn't. So, <laughs> well, that's that's not true. But it, he may not have even done it in this time. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So it does feel a bit like beneath his pay grade to be getting mm. involved with this specific kind of detail and stuff. So I, th I think sure. there's something else being going on. I mean, it got a lot of headlines. It made a lot of sales. It did very well for Marvel, and it end, as I said, it ended up getting a man uh, writing the book. Which was one of the greatest coups over the last couple of years. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mom Villani to, to write Ms. Marvel, and 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 she and yeah, we all know what a great big comic book fan she is. I've done a few articles. My one of my favorite articles was interviewing the her her, her comic shop 
owner, the, the guy who sold her her first copy of a comic with with Ms. Marvel in it. Kind of stuff. And she she keeps going back to the store to do signings for them because um, it, it was the shop that was opposite her her, her uh, school, the high school. That's right. Um, and so she kind of came in there after school and buy her comics. And uh, yeah, that, that's a really good. If you haven't seen those articles, they're wonderful. They're so life affirming and, and fun. Because yeah, she you... is. Uh, she's she's proper. She's proper comic book fan going back all this time. I, I love it. on the uh, red carpet. She was correcting. Kevin Feige of his use of uh, which universe the MCU was. Um, that was, yeah, that's great. I, I, I'm convinced that she's doing that in the films as well. You, oh, so, you can't do that because the issue is so and so. This happened, yeah. We, we she yeah. knows more about Marvel than Kevin does, and I think that's amazing. She's one of us. She is yeah. one of us. Now, I, I know I just said that was the last question. You made <laughs> me think of something that can actually solve. A oh. long-standing conversation on this podcast as it oh. relates to the X-Men. Okay. So we know that From the Ashes is coming. The Krakoan era is at an end. Yes. Now, do you happen to know the timeline of when it was that it was announced that Jordan White's new X-Men was coming, the transition to this new era that we're getting, and whether or not the current creators who are putting out books for the Krakoan end are being rushed into this end, or are they on their natural timeline? I have an article about this. There was seven days when it looked like things changed. There was a look. Uh, you talk about when Tom said he was brought in uh, to talk about taking the books from um, David, and um, then you look at when the last PR thing. There's a panel at San Diego about upcoming X-Men stuff with Jordan White and they tease the new X-Men as a thing that will be announced in November and between and that's a moment where definitely Krakow is still a thing and I've looked at that was about from when Tom says there's about seven days between Tom being invited in to the office about taking over the X-Men uh, books so something big changed things definitely had to change plans because if they were planning Marvel, if X-Men were people at that time in San Diego were planning things to announce in November, so that would be published in, say, January. So they were making January publishing plans that were not about bringing Krakoa to an end. So, yes, things have had to have changed. Absolutely. I, expe I expect. Looking at just at that timeline, I can't see any other way it would have happened. Things were changed for whatever reason. I don't know. I can speculate. Um, but I would say there was a there's like and it looks like there was a seven to eight days period of time when that when when that change was decided at at Marvel at the top. So and you're I love, saying I, I, want, I want the book. I want someone to write the book about those right? seven days, what it was that changed. Because about it's fascinating. So you're saying that Jordan's new X-Men, that tease that we all saw, yes. was not related to ending Krakoa. As far as I'm aware, it was not. Now, I have also learned that we're still going to get that book in a different name, a different title. And I don't know if, it's, if, if it became, if it was, this is, I don't think it's the Heir to an Apocalypse thing. I think it's something else. If we see a book with a Age of Apocalypse character in it, that would originally have been New X-Men. So I'm looking out for that. That's what I've been told. So we'll see. But yes, I, I, I think there was the, the breaks went on hard, the wheels span, and, and, and the big, Kind of beast has turned in a new direction quite fast over that over that span of like one and a half weeks. Fascinating. Now, what, I love what this stuff. could have been? I don't know. Is it sales? Is it about trying to align with a different vision of X Men coming? Um, I I literally don't know. I haven't a clue. I'd like to know more. Wow. Uh, I won't go for a little while until someone writes the book. And, I, and if I can if I can get that information, I have been trying. And I will keep trying. I will. I'm hoping that once a few of the um people are no longer working the books and the NDAs have stopped and a couple of years have passed. I'm looking forward in a couple of years to maybe go back and revisit with some of the people and say, so what actually happened? What did you know? And when did you know it? Those are the questions. <laughs> well, we will be staying tuned for all of that. I can't wait for that reporting. Rich, thank you so, so much for joining us. You have been a revelation. Oh. Uh, it has been an honor to speak with you. To me, you're a legend in this industry and I appreciate everything that you've My done. Wife. Laughing to <laughs> I know it's probably weird to hear this about the man that you are with, but to, to me, 
you know, you are an icon. So thank you for everything that you have done and continue I'm to do. I'm going to let that down. I'm going to be an icon tonight. No, really <laughs> uh, have, a, have a cup of tea, your icon. You know, I'm going to get that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything? Any? Me- Sorry, Kill. Go ahead. I was going to say, better your wife than my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Is- yeah. That's fair enough, yeah. Is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with? You know, obviously go to bleedingcool.com, but is there anything else you want to leave them with? Okay. Tiny nothing. Not a big news or anything. Nothing like that. Just a thought, which was, as you get older, you still like comics. Try and remember why you liked them when you were a kid and not try and put the expectations on them that you've gained from everything else that's gone wrong in the world around you. Um, Because comics are great. Comics do stuff that other mediums just don't do. And um, I'd like them to keep doing it. That'll do. That will do. Thank you so yeah, much, Rich. We're going to say goodbye to him off air. And we'll be back with you live in a moment. That was wow. phenomenal. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can't really put it into words how cool that was for me as somebody who really genuinely does love Bleeding Cool. And uh, I mean, we use it as a resource. We reference it all the time on this on this podcast. And, uh, you know, Rich was incredibly gracious with his time. Um, and it's cool to talk to someone who really does have the knowledge of, you know, more than one decade, multiple decades worth yeah of comics and just being entrenched. Um, so yeah, that was, that was very cool. Yeah. Specifically multiple decades of being entrenched. Yeah. Like we've been doing this a while and we know a lot at varying levels, but like rich has been in it. And I, <laughs> that he referenced, um, uh, Oh geez. What was that magazine comics? Uh, yeah 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 yeah. The, yeah that he referenced that like i took the time to to look that up while he was talking i had quite a bit of time to look that up while he was talking but he, um i was looking some of that up and reading some of it up and like i learned about the the guy that founded it des sheets or whatever it was i think i learned about him in comic book school oh wow like that name was familiar and that magazine was familiar wild yeah, I mean, he's just a just an endless wealth of knowledge. Um, I really wish I could have picked his brain about more things, but the the beauty of it is, you know, we we got off air with him and we said goodbye, and he seemed to have a really good time. And so that tells me that we can probably have him back here at some point, and uh, you know, dive a little deeper into everything, and then get into more stuff. I mean, you re- when you have someone like that, and you can sit at the tree of of what I believe is the tree of knowledge, you just soak that stuff up. Um. Yeah. So I had, a, I had a lot of fun with that. Tyler, you with us? How How you feeling? 
Never take on on call work, guys. That's my lesson from <laughs> from this. I had a little extra money before the show, but uh, your boy is frazzled today. So thank you. What'd you think of Rich? I mean, I'm glad he came in at the same time I came in, so that worked out for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it was great. It's great. Uh, it, Rich is one of those guys where, like, I would see him at conventions and stuff, and I would recognize him. You know, um, I talked. I think I talked to him once when we were uh, when I was with, with Matt, and we were in Longbox. Um, but man, that guy knows some stuff. Yeah, uh, uh, I've not seen him talk about it before. You know, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, seeing a fun personality along with that, I'm like, all right, cool. This this works out. And I, I think it's funny that like people had, you know, I he said several times that like he he feels like he's a a, a gossip columnist. You know, he said that several times through this. Um, and you know, I think I think there is sort of a a reputation that comes with that alone, let alone what he does, you know, on the on the website and what he reports on and how that that all goes. It's funny. Uh, I saw him at Thought Bubble. Jeez, the last time I went, I went to a panel, and he was sitting in the back, and he was literally typing <laughs> um, as this panel was going, and the panel referenced him, you know, in that snarky way that a lot of people on Twitter do. And I saw him kind of look up over his glasses and. <laughs> Yeah, I've never really understood the the reputation that he has. Um, I think the industry needs, you know, uh, someone who's willing to do that and be that person. Um, and when you talk the way he does, when you report the things that he does, you're going to make enemies along the way. Mm. Um, but I, I, I think he's he's reputable. I've always found him to be reputable. And and I think I think the thing is like there's, <laughs> you know, he doesn't like the word, but. There's, you know, there is a skepticism of journalism that's happened, you know, especially in America um, over the years. And, you know, that he sort of deals in a more tabloidy side, but also the fact that, you know, you know, he, he said in while we were talking to him, the that there are people who sort of behind the scenes will tell him, you know, this needs attention, but you didn't hear it from me. Yeah. And then they'll badmouth him on the other side. It's just like, well, yeah, no wonder. Like, right. Yeah. His, his reputation gets dragged by people who are actually feeding him information, which I yeah. think is, that's fascinating. It's, um, it's, Atomic it's, Hound said, amazing. I've heard so many perspectives on Rich over the years, but never from him. I love the opportunity to hear directly from him. I've only heard him speak one time, and it was the, literally the, the YouTube video that he just did, which was like three minutes talking about Absolute Comics. Other than that, I've never even heard his voice. So for me, uh, all of this was was brand new, um, and I was I was fascinated. He did a podcast with, I think it was the Forbidden Planet podcast with um, Andrew Sumner, uh, maybe a year, six months to a year ago. And uh, I listened to that because I was really interested in it. Um, and I mean, he said a lot of the same stuff here, but there's still some stuff in there that yeah. might, uh, might be worth listening to. And he was good enough to give us, you know, little tidbits and morsels of exclusives about Absolute DC. I'm sure we'll see a lot more of that coming down the pike. So definitely stay tuned to bleedingcool.com for all of that. Now we have a piece of business to do. Of course, every single week on the show, we tell you guys about patreon.com slash the comics pals, which is the best way to support us if you enjoy what we do. And, you know, interviews like that, the one we just had with Rich. The amazing interviews that we've been able to get over the last year, you know, those things are due to the fact that we have an audience that shows up. People know that they can come here and get their voice heard. So we appreciate everybody who does that. If you want to go the extra layer and show that you care and support the fact that we do these things, patreon.com slash the comics palace is the best way to do that. And I have an obligation to all of you that support us over there to let, you know, to give you guys your moment, to shout you guys out um, amongst all the other perks that you get through our Patreon page, you get a superhero and a superhero nickname, a superhero and a supervillain nickname, and an enshrinement in the Palsverse. So I want to say a special thank you to the best pals in the universe. 
Thunderstruck Rebecca Alejandro, The Hound of Justice Atomic Hound, Starcross Catherine Stars, and The Red Spiral Spiral Storm. And I also want to thank the Red, the Red, I'm sorry, the Night Stalker Harris Dijinsky, Brian Demolisher Del Pozo, Kefis the Incorruptible, Momenta Mike Elliott, Dan the Truth Trudeau, Joel Justice, Jalen the Sanguine Sorcerer, Marley Manistorm, Slow Flow Dameron, Amin Almighty Perez, Pete the Dreamweaver Collins, Christian Uncaged Harriet, Always Laughing, The Spear of Justice, Izzy Spears, The Great Destroyer Hyper Viper 89, The Storm of Pain, Sanji San, and Adam Smith. And the best boy, Bernie, which is a right. new introduction. But because this has been three hours, I am sapped. And I'm sure we are all sapped. And you guys have been hanging over there in with us for a long time. I promise you, Adam Smith, I will get to your uh, shout out. I have it written. I, I, I stayed up till 5 a.m. writing it. I wanted to make sure I did as good as I could for it. But we just don't have time. But thank you, Adam. You're great, and I appreciate the words that you shared with us on the Patreon page uh, on my newsletter. I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you all so much. The next time that we will be live with you is Thursday for Pals Pulse. We're going to hang out, talk some comics with you guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. Next week, Saturday, 10, 15 a.m. Eastern, this same channel, this same show, we're going to have – BJ Kicks from Comics Are Dope. Join us. He's going to come hang out. We're going to talk some comics and shoot the breeze with my man. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're not going to want to miss it. Book Club, Mr. Miracle Book Club. That's going to be happening uh, here in just a couple of weeks. Tuesday the 30th. Mr. Miracle won the... Oh, Tyler. Tyler holding up a very nice Ooh, copy of uh, Mr. Miracle. I guess it's a hardcover version. I don't know. I I've never seen it. Oh. Just looks, looks I got nice. it from Mitch directly, so. Oh. Okay. So, is it signed? Uh yeah. Ooh. Hell yeah. Yeah. Nice. It's cool. Nice. One of my favorites, oh, so I'm shit. excited to talk about it for sure. I've never read it. Oh wow. I've never read it. Oh yeah. hell. Because I was in Luxembourg. Mm, I think I was in New Zealand in Luxembourg when it was coming out. And in Europe, it's tough to get American comics if you're not in like a major, major city. Like Paris has a one or two shops in one. It's funny. There's a, a, a block that's made for comic books. There are like two places that sell American books and there are like four Tintin shops. Um, and then there's a, a, a like a Disney shop um, that's like Disney Funko Pops. Um, but um, other than that, it's tough to get American comics there. So when I was asking for it, the 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 shop owner in my town was like, yeah, uh, everybody's been asking about it. I didn't hear anything about it. And then 40 people came in and asked for it. And I, wow. I have no idea how to get it. <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, Aaron, we said, uh, it's great to see you. Uh, up each other on having comic book industry people around here even better when you guys have been doing this show every week for years glad your love for comics hasn't diminished well thank you um thank you i appreciate that and i know you've been with us for some time too i don't think my love of comics will ever diminish and i think it's it, it's it's refueled by this podcast it's refueled mm. by my connection with kale and tyler and marco and us coming on here every week it's refueled by the reviews that we do it's refueled by discord and the conversations that we yeah. get to have with you all it's refueled by the live chat and of course the incredible guests that we get to have i can't see this ever ending for me it, it mm. evolves too yeah you know my tastes evolve what i want to listen to and, and cover evolves um and that that refreshes me I think it, yeah. it ref you know, especially early on, like I was really starting to be bitter about comics. You very, very genuinely, yeah. Um, but I having the audience and seeing like passion, and then even just like getting more in touch with creating stuff, really, uh, uh, has ignited you know, uh, reignited my, my passion for it. Like even try, you know, 
trying to pivot into screenwriting so that I could fuel a comics career is just like, you know, it's, it's tough, but it's uh, like, I can't imagine myself doing anything different. I could definitely say for me, I've noticed a change in you over the years, as far as your enthusiasm level about, you know, comics and the stuff that we do for sure. I, I, I used to be vehemently against a comic book review show. In 2016, I would not have done House Pulls. If that's what the show would have been, I wouldn't have done it. And even when we started it, I was like, no, I'm not going to be on that. <laughs> yeah. You were. And, I remember, uh, yeah. 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 Because I, 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 I can't, I can't always afford money is a very tricky subject for me. I can't always afford the books. You know, uh, a little peek behind the curtain. Sean gives me his digital codes so that I can do the Marvel books. Um, and then I'll buy, you know, the indies and uh, and the DC books uh, as and when they're not fifteen dollars. Um, but um, it's you know, it's tough. It's a tough thing. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I think people, you know, I'm not trying to cry about it, but like people underestimate the grind of this. Yeah. Um, you know, I love what I do. We we all love this, but it is taxing financially, it's taxing mentally, emotionally, whatever. It's not like this is our literal job, right? Like we're not on the clock right now, right? Well, I was. So, it, well, yeah. <laughs> Tyler got paid to do this. Um, we 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 benefit when you guys decide we do, you know? Um, and that's really how this game works. And I'm cool with that because we were doing this for years for nothing. Um, so the fact that now there's a little bit of kickback and, you know, we can keep the lights on a little bit and, and have some more uh, incentive and not have to go out of pocket for things like, um, you know, microphones or, you know, certain things like that. I mean, our New York Comic Con coverage was funded by you guys, literally. Comic Boom brings up a great point. It's because of collaborative channels like co the Comics Pals that makes my enjoyment of the hobby richer. Well. We feel that way, and our collaborators aren't us. It's us and you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The The fifth chair of this show is the audience. Yep. 100%. You guys sit right there where my dog sits. <laughs> uh, Tom Account says, being part of this community is just jet fuel for my love for comics. Thanks so much for what you do. You're very welcome, and thank you for sticking along with us and being you know, a ride-or-die supporter um, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Trust and believe me. Um, I don't think there's any surprise that, you know, in my opinion, you know, our show has gotten a lot better since we started going live, since we opened up the Patreon, since we started doing all those. I mean, and obviously since Tyler came on board, but like all these things happen at the same time for us to be here and 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 we're still i don't think we're that far along i think there's a lot more to go i want to get a lot more people in on the fold of this thing we're doing here a lot more guests to have a lot there's a lot more to come so thank you to everybody who's a part of this journey we really really appreciate it you guys are amazing thank you so much we're gonna get out of here we will be back with you on thursday for pals pulls like i said earlier appreciate you hanging out we love you thank you till next time Take care, guys.